B A M with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. All right, it's half past seven this Tuesday morning. You're very welcome along to OTBM. It's Jerry Gilroy and David Snade with you this morning. David, good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, Jerry. You were saying this is your first time back in our studio since COVID started. I know, yeah. And then even listening to that music coming in there now, I'm feeling buzzing now. Yeah. Got, got a nice free coffee from a hotel around the corner. That's mad. Well, you just wandered in and said, how you doing? Was it like... Well, I went in and I just saw there was like, it was just a hotel around the corner here and there was like a little station. I was like, when your coffee's gone? And he was like, well, we're not open, but... Like, do you want one? I was like, yeah, okay. Very good. So I just wanted to give a small bit of po- um, positivity to hotels at Dublin. Yeah, well, very good. <laughs> All right, Jesus. Because I, I, you kind of walk past and think, it looks nice in there sometimes. In the fairness, it was. And the fairness this hour of the morning as well, I was half tempted to go in and try and get a room, especially with a three-year-old at home. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to get in touch with us this morning, you can get us 0879-180-180. That's the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. We will talk about Ralph Ranick. Uh, he's obviously been confirmed. We've done a bit on this before, but Daniel Harris is going to join us in about 15 minutes to talk to us about um, what the Man United fans think about that. We'll get into that in a couple of minutes' time, but news came through last night that the FAI have had a conversation at board level about Stephen Kenny, and it was positive. And that's all they told us. Yeah. The official release is short, and they said no further comment until this point. And... None of the none of the stereotypical leaks that we would see in the papers. No kind of this was decided. This is what's going to happen, or this is what they're thinking. Yeah, because I think a bit of war came through last night. That to be a statement released, and you're kind of thinking that bit of oil smoke that they're going to actually be a bit definitive. But it was basically a statement about a meeting that happened in the Castlenock Hotel for a good few hours, and obviously the twelve independent directors. It was interesting when like um, Packy Bonner did an event for the FAO. I think it was a couple of weeks ago now in town. And you kind of made that point, stressed that point, the fact that this wasn't going to be one person putting their foot down and saying this is what's happening, that's going to be a kind of collective decision, kind of acting like grown-ups essentially, you know, but like, and then you're hoping some of those grown-ups might want to uh, have loose lips and then I was sending a couple of messages last night when the, when the statement came out and even this morning and kind of normally the people who you might expect to kind of get back and, and give you a bit of a steer or whatever weren't, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, but you would, the fact that the nature of it and how, how the campaign ended, it's just obviously going to be what they're going to offer Stephen Kenny like is it going to be acceptable to him is it going to be what he deserves I suppose or what he feels he deserves and, and it, it, well, for what he wants to do and, and bringing the, the job forward because like if you're looking at the campaign as a whole and they stress that as well the point of looking at the campaign in the entirety so it's like making make, make, stressing the point that yeah everything ended quite positively and the, the feeling around the national team is very strong at the moment in terms of the kind of, kind of connection between the fans the manager and the players and everything but you can't forget what happened at the start, which is right in fairness. You can't gloss over it. But and do do you look at what was going on? Do you know, like if you're viewing everything in its totality, that's grand. So long as yeah. you, you take the, we have an inexperienced uh, senior international manager who who has people working against him within the organisation who are leaking things to the press, who faces an investigation which ultimately gets found to be in a, a, a bag of smoke. Nothing. Mm. Nothing. Uh, who loses his first team coach and then replaces him with the first team coach of the European Champions? Like, do we take all that in, or is it just yeah. uh, you got beaten by Luxembourg? Like, well, we, that's my concern here. Is that like I think more people now on the on the board and uh, even people in the FAO who are obviously would, would be making this decision, they are seeing what how things have materialised and how the whole campaign has played out, and the fact that the wheels didn't come off after what happened at the start and the fact that Stephen Kenny was able to bring things together the fact that he was able to convince someone clearly of Anthony Vardy's stature to come in and get involved the fact that things that well I suppose it was a bit early in the morning but the fact that things the wheels didn't fall off that hasn't gone unnoticed like if if the results had stayed had had even deteriorated or performances or the mood around the camp or the fact that obviously post COVID there was able people in the FAI were able to get more of a sense of what things are like around the, the hotel and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. All, well, them, all those signs are, yeah. have been positive. Like. But I, and look, COVID obviously affected loads of teams in different ways from an Ireland perspective with a new squad. It was very hard for them to get together. The first time they started to get together was really the Andorra game and it wasn't a straightforward line. The, mm-hmm. the progress line didn't climb immediately but it de- definitely began to get to a point where team has an identifiable shape and so uh, everybody who comes into the squad knows that they're going to have a role within that shape uh, players are interchangeable within that which I think is a particularly good sign it means that everybody understands what everybody else is supposed to be doing as well like as in players can play in different positions we saw Seamus Coleman play on the right side of the back three which we weren't sure if that was going to be an option but it was we've also seen them play right wing back in the game in Faro so uh, we've, we've 
Go on. Yeah, but it's interesting as well. One of the things that kind of struck me about what even like all the talk around us. So when 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 Damien Duff left and there was a lot of talk about what's happening with Stephen Kenny and I would have spoken to people and I remember doing a piece for the Irish Examiner about kind of the story of what happened with Damien Duff and speaking to people who were there and how angry he had been about obviously the leaks that had come out and, the, and that investigation but then even speaking to players because obviously there were stories there was all sorts of stories about the fact that players were disgusted and that Seamus Coleman had been made to do a press conference and stuff when it clearly wasn't it wasn't the case Coleman later came out and said that but like I would have been speaking to people around the camp kind of off the record kind of getting back on information to kind of be trying to write stuff from a point of view of a bit of strength where obviously people aren't going to come out on the record then but then bit by bit stuff that you're getting told off the record by people is coming out then on the record because people realise that actually something needed to be said and also the work that was being done was clearly going to be hopefully coming to fruition and you see player, players essentially as well coming out and talking about the work that had been done and the changes that had been made around the camp like Robbie Brady like one of the things that had been mentioned about Robbie Brady and Jeff Hendrick to me before I came out was just how their own kind of happiness around the camp in terms of what the work that was being done like some of them like, said to me even recently like Jeff Hendrick's like a new man around the camp in terms of having a responsibility but also feeling as if he can take on that responsibility and that he has the instructions to actually carry it out and, and materialise the same like, a lot of time with Jeff Hendrick that he'd be getting like Obviously, his performances had dipped after the Euros. You couldn't get away from that. But it does seem to be a case that Stephen Kenny and the coaching staff have obviously identified, well, this is what we want you to do. This is how you're going to try and do it. And this is how you do it. And he's kind of reacted to that. And that's kind of brought him on, even around the camp, from pe- speaking to people, just how he, how he is like and how he's carrying himself. He's a slightly different person. Not that he was like moody or, or whatever, but... I'd say uncertain, lacking confidence. Yeah, 100%. Was, I mean, and it manifested itself on the field of play. And he's and he's done, but this is what Stephen Kenny has done, with even not just with, say, bringing through some younger players who can just come into a new camp with a flurry of excitement and adrenaline and can just bounce through that and not have to deal with a lot of the stuff that comes with playing for Ireland and all the rest of it but some of the older heads that who have been in there and around it as well have, have come on because they see and they know what their jobs are now well, and Duffy and McLean are good examples I think yeah. like they both like I think Duffy, with Duffy as well I think Duffy has benefited I would not more so but like you can't get away from the fact that what he's done at club level for himself as well that, that's been a major thing like I'd say if he had still been struggling at club level and not had the start he had at Brighton and coming in it could have been a lot more difficult for him and I think I think and even Kenny has been kind of keen to kind of step back from almost taking any credit for that. He's kind of always put it on Duffy and I think that's right because like and even for Graham Potter too, like he kind of Duffy sees his chance with Brighton at the start of the season. Although he kind of hasn't started the last couple of games. He just got dropped at the weekend, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah, well you know, they're and They've been defending quite well recently. Uh, they went on they they went on the great run at the start of the season. He was playing well, and then the run disappeared. And since then, they've been scratching out draws. So we'll see. I mean, it, it wouldn't be terribly surprised to see him back in the team. I I do think that um, James McLean's form for Ireland has been excellent since he's been in the yeah. team. So basically, what we're saying is the young lads are good, the young lads are good. See, the, the atmosphere is good. Like, why would you not double down and take the opportunity to say? We're going to commit for the next, and it's not like this isn't a this isn't a contract for four years that we're talking about. It's just the next actual proper tournament. Mm. The Nations League is obviously uh, means means to qualify, and it has actually become imbued with some more meaning. That was a misstep, I would argue, by Stephen Kenny. He shouldn't have said. I think we're going to win that. Win it. Well, I didn't think we. That's what we're aiming for. That's what you said. That's what we're going for now. I think that kind of in the heat of the moment. It's it, it's an interest because the thinking. What's what is the thinking from the FAI? Is it right? It is just campaign by campaign. You have to still have to prove you're capable of doing this job. Which, let's be honest, like that's probably you know, that's how a lot of management is. Like you know what I mean? Like it's very rare that you will get total unfettered access or unfettered kind of reason to go and just do a job, even no matter how things are going. In terms of of results, you do need to marry it up. I think the fact that Kenny has begun to do that in the second half of of the campaign, when as you were mentioning earlier, where he like, when he has those training camps as well, and you can see the development then. So, like, do the FAI have been born before? Like, will they give that extended contract or will it just be for, for one, for that, for that Nations League, for the full Nations League campaign? So that's what's going to come out now over the next little while once, obviously, the FAI, when the negotiations when Jonathan happen. Hill sits down with, with Stephen Kenny's agent and goes through it and, and goes through what their thinking is. And I think that's when you'll begin to kind of get a clearer sense of what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah, uh, it doesn't feel like the Nations League is a long-term commitment, though. It's kind no. of a... It seems a bit like a holiday romance when actually... 
they should just get married at this point and say, right, we're going to back you fully. And if the divorce comes after the Euros, that's fine. If it comes after a World Cup, then that means the Euros has gone well. Like, there's a, there's a means to an end here of actually making Irish football look like a coherent package where we have long-term, we have a vision of what mm-hmm. we're trying to achieve and that vision is matched up on the field of play, commercially, in our uh, communications and in our grassroots initiatives. But it doesn't feel like that's all joined up at the moment. Yeah, and like this is a kind of a campaign where you do feel as if that connection seems to be there with a group of like players, especially because there is like there's young players, and as we mentioned, there's all some of the older players and more experienced players who are kind of coming on as well. But I just think it's difficult. For, I think it's almost strange. But it's because of the nature of where the FBI are at as well with their with their finances, and you can't get away from the fact that they have to qualify for the tournament in terms of even just bringing money in. I remember. Um, like even just listening, like listening to um, people talking about this, and you, like you can't, it is one hundred percent right. Like you can't, like you can't get away from the fact that if if a target is set out for the manager where we need to qualify for the tournament, that's your goal, then he has to deliver that. So that's if those are the talks between say Stephen Kenny and and say Jonathan Hill and, and stuff when when he goes out to sit down and discuss what's what's needed of him for his contract. If he says, well, your target now is to win the Nations League, that's what get gets you a new contract guaranteed. Well then, that's kind of how the game works as well. Do you know what I mean? But then, if the FAI feel, you know what, things are strong enough, we're building financially now. It's not going to be a huge outlay to to keep you as manager. We are, we do believe in what you're doing, regardless of how the holiday romance goes. We're in it for the long haul. That's what we need to know. Like, yeah, and look, that's a fair point, and it's good to tease these things out. But I do feel like the if the the previous regimes were at all have been told, right? You you need to qualify here, and so what they did was they battened down the hatches tried to scratch their way to a one-all draw over the course of the campaign, essentially, and to one-all draw their way through. And in the long run, we've actually seen that the fans aren't that keen on that type of football. Like, the the connection with the team and the atmosphere around the, the ground, apart from a few uh, places along the way, like, it's not great to watch. Mm. Whereas the, the football's now better to watch. Like, for me, it feels like you need a football culture that is going to be engaging with everybody. That, like... The kids want to play it. The the fans and parents want to go to the matches. The you want to go with your mates to see the game because it's a good thing to do. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to well, we're going to go and watch Ireland, and it's a bit of a chore. Yeah. But we'll have the crack. Do you know, like the team, the thing was associated with crack as opposed to what it's supposed to be, which is football. I had this thing, remember, with Wally O'Tink and like kind of Irish football, like the difference between say joy and happiness, where like you have these little bursts of joy every maybe ten years at a, at a major tournament. And if that's what you want, and that's all you cared about, well probably then, Brady's goal is joy. Yeah, exactly. But then, like, do you want to be happy? Do you want to have sustained happiness? Where, yeah, you might not qualify for every single tournament, but you know that you're going to be turning up for every campaign when it is, say, in November, and it's freezing cold and it's horrible. But you know that you're actually going to be not just entertained, but hopefully the team will still win as well. And you you, you have a feeling for for your national team. That's the whole point of we of with, with international football like kind of you see what happens with the rise of say club football and the dominance of say the Premier League and all the rest of it where like people are so used to now to a certain quality that they're not going to really like stick with rubbish just because it's just because it's Ireland do you know what I mean but if they see and they have that feeling of a connection with the team and they see that they are trying to do the right things but but then also that it is going to try and deliver success because you can't get away from that is needed as well well I wonder like it yeah. is but it's about what's more putting, likely to deliver success. Place. Exactly, it's about putting it, putting those building blocks in, blocks in place and trusting if they do trust the manager and the staff who are there to deliver that. Well, then they have to they have to back it. Now, as well, the point she also made as well that you could see what's happening with Stephen Kenny and what he's doing and say, right, well, that is clearly the way to go. But if they feel as if he's not the person to actually bring it on and continue on and sustain it, well, then you have to respect those opinions as well, and you have to say, well, uh, uh, like. Are, is that warranted? Is that justified? Off the back of this campaign as a whole, I think you 100% he deserves at least one more campaign, I would say, and th- the chance to, s- to prove that he's capable of continuing the work that he's done. If he isn't, well, then that's a different conversation, and then you'll have it, you know? It's true, and if he isn't, then there should be a bunch of obvious candidates who we think will be able to do that. and In the same kind of yeah, mode, that, rather than it's not one or the other, you know what I mean? It's not as if you have to go, oh, well, this is how Warriors football has been. This is what how football is evolving and changing, but we have to do something different, or we have to do this. Like it doesn't have to be like that, Holly. Um, there isn't a huge list of candidates who it, it feels like at the moment who would be available to do that and who would understand Irish football culture and who would. Is there? 
Are there obvious people who are natural successors to Stephen Kenny? Um, in the same vein, who're going to play some good football as opposed to because you can give Neil Lennon in, the gig. in general or in Ireland in terms of well, coaches coming through because there's a lot there's like there are a lot of progressive coaches coming through obviously in in the Republic of Ireland and in the League of Ireland at the moment. I don't know. Like I'm trying to think like. I'd, like there are like I'm, I'm trying to scratch now thinking of all these managers and the head coaches now, but like no, there would be of course. Like there's like Stephen Kenny isn't the only man who can manage the Republic of Ireland. He's not the only man that has the kind of vision that he has. Like, but he's the man who's in there at the moment and has been building those relationships with players and who has been working with players. So do you start from scratch again a little bit and kind of have those relationships need to be built again and that and that going through it again when it doesn't need to be? It'd be different if like. If the campaign had ended so like terribly and there was no signs of any progress whatsoever, then you'd be like, you if know what? Portugal beat us. We draw in our last game away to Luxembourg, and it's like, all right, well, that didn't end very well. But even yeah, even that. But even like even if like obviously the results obviously then at that point were important. But even though it was a campaign where we weren't going to qualify from, but it was more so the fact that you were seeing the the plans in place were, were coming through. Like you could actually see that the coaching that's been happening with the on the training pitch is is working and. All the signs are positive, so like but you know, time in international football to do any good coaching, David. We know, you know, you've got such a short time with the players, you can't really have any impact. You know, was it? I can, you know, and I only again, I'm only from speaking to people around the place, and it kind of it, make, it makes perfect sense. But like with that, one of the things that they kind of decided is, well, what's the best way that players learn? Trying to suss out how players learn and take on information most effectively. So like the whole thing of oh, well, you have to be on the training pitch, and then that's when your work is done. But it's actually been looking at how players take on information. Is it being on the training pitch, walking through stuff with them, they take it in quicker that way, visually in the say analysis room or written down and stuff like that and like, this has all been played into it and it always sounds so basic and it's so obvious but if you were able to utilise that information with players and know exactly how players learn because every player not every player but players oh, they would do, learn yeah. differently yeah. that's what's been a, a big thing here it hasn't just been a right here's a team meeting for you and, and blah 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 and we, we went and trained for, for an hour and a half if you get, even get that like there's different aspects to it that have been coming through and it seems to have been working yeah. All right. It's uh, seven forty-seven this morning. We'd love to hear your views. Uh, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream, or of course, you can always uh, get us on 087-9-180-180. OTBAM with Gillette, proud sponsors of November. Gentlemen, let's mow. Today is the uh, Judgment Day, so that's why this is all going on. Um, here's what's coming up between now and ten o'clock this morning. Tanya Harris is going to join us in just a moment. We'll bring you through the sports pages. Uh, good interview with. Uh, Katie Taylor Donald McRae has done a, a Katie Taylor special that's in the papers we'll talk about that with um, John Duggan a little bit later on running to the sports news at 8.35 talk about Ireland against Georgia tonight it's a big game for Vera Pau because if she loses then um, well if she loses then that's that there's no coming back from that because that campaign will be over they've got to win and they've got to win convincingly uh, our Mo rankings at 9 o'clock uh, Stephen O'Donnell St. Patrick's Athletic Manager for now uh, a cup winner this week is going to join us at 10 past 9 and then we'll play some highlights of um Darren Cave and Fiona Coughlin talking to us yesterday. Uh, Fiona Hayes, sorry, talking to us yesterday on Monday Night Rugby. Uh, now, uh, why such a push for a contract extension for Stephen Kenny? Where would Kenny go from the Irish job if the FAI wait a few months? Uh, that's a that's a double edged sword, right? Like you you play Billy Big Balls with Stephen Kenny, and he's like, okay, Grant, find somebody else, and and then suddenly that's not how it works, though. You know what I mean? You have to show a bit of faith in a, in a, in a manager and a bit of belief in him as well, and and kind of and actually, and, and also as well, it's a bit of respect. You know what I mean? So you can't just say, well, what, what else are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, if you have to well, you show can, you, a bit you, of vision you, as well, you, you know what I mean? You can do that, right? And it turns out people, there are lots of people who actually think that's the right thing to do. But Liam Brady's like, no, don't give him a long term contract. Give him six months. Give him an extra six months. It's like. But listen, I don't think people are saying, no, you have to give him 10 years regardless of no, what's it's happened. The next it's, campaign. It's, 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 exactly, One campaign. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Like. Oh, you understand this? No, you understand where what, what you're saying, but like if that's how people want to go, and it's like kind of it's like hand to mouth essentially, do you know what I mean? Like, or what do you want to do? Do you want to have something that's a bit more sustainable, and given and given that campaign, that next campaign to actually show that he can, to show that he can do it, you know? Like so, it's this conversation has been going back and forth. It's felt for so long, and it's been to be honest, it's been head wrecking for so long. Where it's like every single game, because he is a manager who's come from say the League of Ireland and wouldn't have say a CV wouldn't have a CV that in fairness let's be honest for a lot of jobs wouldn't have warranted where where he, where he's got to he's kind of got he has come in and, and stuff but like it's not a million miles away from Gareth Southgate's right except that Southgate managed in his country and it's a higher level than the League of Ireland like it's you know Southgate's club record wasn't great but he got the under 21 gig and in a time of crisis they turned to him and gave him the job 
That's kind of what happened. Okay, obviously, slightly different scenario. No pint of wine involved. But, it's, but even saying that about his CV, because it's almost doing it down. Like obviously, he's he's been very successful as a manager with with Dundalk, but also the amount of times games he has played in Europe, and he's so used to setting up a team that is so often going to be an underdog in Europe. And I do think that obviously that campaign in 2016 with Dundalk would have captured a lot of people's um, imagination as well. But I just think. At this point, you can only judge him. I don't think he can judge him on what, of what's come before. He's the Ireland manager. You're judging him on what he's doing as the Ireland manager and how he's going about it. Yeah. And I, I, don't get me like obviously the start of the World Cup campaign was was a disaster. It was very poor, but it was also at a point where he was trying to change a lot of stuff in terms of style of play and personnel. If people think who have been watching the Ireland team for the last while that there haven't there hasn't been significant significant progress, not just on the pitch but off the pitch and the atmosphere and the feeling around the place. Well, then they're living in a different planet. They really are. Like they haven't been going to games if they don't think that there is serious progress being made. Exactly. Uh, Leo Messi won the Ballon d'Or last night. A lot of people are uh, pissed off about this. Jared says, "How did Messi get the Ballon d'Or this year? It should have been between Lewandowski and Salah. For me, the former, but you couldn't argue against Salah getting it. But Messi." And Dyke says, how the hell did Messi pull so many political strokes to win the Ballon d'Or? Awful decision. A tainted award now. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo had a row with um, the editor of France Football Magazine who said... Uh, know, to be honest, the biggest shock is that an award voted by journalists wasn't won by a Bowes player. <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. Uh, the Ballon d'Or uh, is obviously something that Messi and Ronaldo do hold a lot of weight and it, it matters to them a lot. Yeah, I don't know if this is just me. Like... I think they're the ones who have actually made the award a much, much bigger thing. The fact that it seems to have been a battle between the two of them for so long to be the best player in the world, like that, the, whole, the last decade, essentially, I suppose. Like, I don't know, like, I've never been one to actually care who won the Ballon d'Or. Like, I genuinely remember Mike Lone talking about the fact that he won the Ballon d'Or uh, when he was at Liverpool. Like, I'd totally forgotten that Mike Lone even existed for a while. Well, that's pretty bad. I don't mean that. I just mean as in winning that award. Like I just think that they're the two lads who've actually taken it to a different it level. To the, it matters to the players. We had um, Robert Perez on, and I think this bit might hasn't gone out yet, or maybe it went out last Friday. But uh, we were talking about Thierry Henry. Thierry Henry never won it and never kind of got that close to it. I think he might have finished second or third once. Yeah. He's like, Ballon d'Or is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous competition. <laughs> How could Thierry Henry, best player in the world for like three or four seasons, not have won it? Mm. And like, I didn't go. And Michael Owen won it. Michael Owen won it basically because he scored that hat-trick against Germany and then two goals in the cup final in the space of about five months. Not the two goals in the cup final. One goal in the cup final, was it? In the, 2001? Against Liverpool. He scored two, didn't he? It was 2-1 against Arsenal. He scored them both, did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So, in the last few minutes, yeah. Um, and obviously the FA Cup would have been beamed around the world still at that stage and the game against the hat-trick in Germany against Germany, that's obviously quite a good thing to... Um, mm. And that, I, cause he, that's why he won it. It wasn't on the basis of anything else. But, the, yeah, I just... I don't know. I just Again, it's just one of those awards where, like, this is only from a personal point of view, like... It hasn't really been something that you're like, oh, can't, oh that, the Ballon d'Or, amazing. They it's more so like, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I do think, well, maybe, it, obviously, that's period I was talking about on I suppose, like, let's be honest, like, if you're at that level, you're going to have an, an, e- an element of an ego about you. You're not going to be there if you don't. Something so. has to get you up at a bend, as opposed to, oh, there'll be 50 or 60 goals this year, I'm not sure. And poor Lewandowski. Um, I feel I feel worse for him even the fact that because they, they didn't have it in 2020 when he was actually, like, <laughs> yeah. when they... They could easily have just done it. But it's just amazing. Like, and even Lewandowski, like, that period for the last few years like it's just phenomenal what he's been doing for it, Munich. Like, it, it really is, is like. yeah uh, Daniel Harris is with us this morning Daniel good morning to you alright any thoughts on the Ballon d'Or before we get to Ralph Ranić? Uh, I, f- I mean I, f- I caught the end of your conversation there and I felt like I could see why Messi won it in that ultimately he probably is still the best player in the world and winning um, winning, winning a trophy with Argentina is probably what swung it in the end um, so yeah, I can I can see why it went to him. I could have seen if it would have gone to Lewandowski as well. So uh, it wasn't a year where you felt like there was someone who was miles and miles ahead of everyone else. But I think with Messi, we need to be careful not to say, well, he didn't have such a good year this year because it wasn't as mind-boggling, really ridiculous as what he was doing when he was at his peak. Because what he did for anyone else would still have been mind-bogglingly ridiculous. Yeah, it's true. We, we do kind of forget that he's completely recalibrated our ex- expectations for what is a, a good season and a great season. Um, though it seems like a kind of funny time of the year to be announcing the best player of the year. It's like it's the end of November and like 
Salah's form over the last three months has been so good, but I don't know. Anyway, look, this isn't that important. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Football takes place in seasons, not in calendar years. Yeah, it's a bit mad. So, did he win it for last season? Is it, it is a calendar year? Yeah, it won't be for that. Wouldn't it be up until last season? Wouldn't it have been? I don't. I actually, I need to look that up properly. So before I weigh in heavily with the hot take on the Ballon d'Or that I don't really believe in, <laughs> uh, let's 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 talk about Ralph Rangnick though, because obviously there's been plenty of time for this to percolate through to the Man United fans and kind of see exactly what they think about it. What what do what do you think about it? Uh yeah, I think it it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. It seems like a good appointment, but you never know. We've seen four five, four people, five if you count Ryan Giggs, five people fail post Fergie. So you could can't really be sure at this point what it's going to take to succeed. I think what's good about Rannick is I think this squad will be good for him because he likes young players, he likes running. And this squad has lots of good young players, hasn't been running enough. I think that's going to stop. Um, I think that he will have a vision of what he wants from the team and what, how he intends them to play. And I think he'll be ruthless in making sure that he imposes that. And I think among the various things that did follow Egan Solskjaer, lack of ruthlessness was a really big one. In that, it, Before he got the job, he was actually was quite ruthless. He got rid of Fellaini, he got rid of Lukaku very quickly. But subsequent to that, if he came across players he didn't like or who weren't doing it for him, he kept giving them chances and chances and chances. And when players performed badly for him, he kept carried on picking them. I don't think that'll happen under Rannick, who has the backing of the board, who has political capital, who has a history to show that people should do what he says. And I think that will be important, speaking personally, but also I think in a way speaking culturally, the kind of football that Rannick plays is the kind of football that I want to watch and also the kind of football that has succeeded at United. United's best teams have all been power teams. They haven't been possession teams. And um, personally for me, like when I go to football, I want to stand behind the goal and I want my personal space, in, I want my personal space um, interfered with. I want invaded. I want it to be dirty and I want it to be primal. And that is what I want to see represented on the pitch as well. And I think that's what we'll see from from, a, from Rannick's team. And that's not to say I'm saying that possession football is no good or isn't something I can also enjoy watching. I'm just saying that this is a personal thing for me, what I want to see. And I also think it's what the majority of United fans want to see because it's what we've been raised on. And I think it's what people will find it easy to get behind. There are obviously some drawbacks. I think one of them is that I mean, your, your classic, your Paul Mersons will say, well, why hasn't he ever managed a big club? And I think there are reasons as to why that is, to do with the fact that big clubs tend not to like disruptors necessarily, and also just the way circumstance sometimes works out. I do wonder, as you always wonder, I feel like with players who haven't ever managed very many, who haven't managed very many superstars, if they know the difference between a really, really good player and a superstar, uh, an elite level player, and whether whether they understand that sometimes you have to make allowances for those people, because Rannick is obviously very is obviously very implacable about everything's to the team, and that is true. Everything is for the team, but sometimes the team needs to allow a little bit of leeway for someone whose contribution to the team deserves that little bit of leeway. We saw it with Eric Cantona, we've seen it with Roy Keane, we saw it with Cristiano Ronaldo, and I guess that brings us on to Ronaldo. But he's coming into a situation where generally. Someone who runs as much as Cristiano does is not exactly the kind of player that Rannick tends to deploy, but he has to deploy Ronaldo because he's one of the best players in the team. And without him this season, United would be in even more of a mess than they already are. So I think that that would be one of his jobs is to find a way of keeping the high energy pressing going whilst retaining Ronaldo. And I think that should be something of which he's capable. Okay. Uh what about the short-term nature of the whole deal? I, I get the point on the ruthlessness. It'd be difficult for him to come in and make significant changes in the next transfer window, for example, if he didn't feel like he was somehow a position of importance over the next two years. That whole two-year uh, consultancy thing, what, what do you think that means in practice? Uh, I actually think that that credit, I would give credit for that to John Murtagh and Darren Fletcher because neither of them are experienced in building football clubs. I don't know that much about John Murtagh, but Darren Fletcher was someone, when he was a player, I thought would be a good manager or a good coach or something because he he's play, he's a player, obviously he played under Alex Ferguson, which is no, gauge, no guarantee of success, as we've learned, but he's someone who had to think very hard about how best to adapt his game 
He's a great talker. He's a really clever guy. And he's brilliant when he talks about the football. Extremely compelling, extremely detailed, says things you haven't thought of. So I think what him and Murta have done is they've probably diluted their power slightly for the benefit of the club. And they've done it in order to learn. And I think as well as coaching the players, Rannick is also going to be coaching the coaches. He's going to be coaching them. And I think that two-year consultancy will be really helpful in getting United to a position where the people in the club are good. And so I think that what that's going to happen is you're going to have that level of, um, of, co- of continuity where you're going to have someone who doesn't just depart after six months, but who's able to impart the things, the principles that he agrees with, not just in terms of play, but in terms of running a club and inculcating those principles throughout. And so I think that's a very good idea to keep him on. I mean, I presume it was his idea because why would you leave a job just for six months to then be cut adrift when you're not going to employ someone different? But Rannick looks a lot like someone you want involved in your football club. His track record tells us that. So anything United can do to keep him involved seems like a good thing. And Daniel, do you not think it's like, the main point of this six months should be to actually get everything lined up in terms of the mentality in that squad for who the next manager should be? In terms of, there's no, uh, point, in him, no point in him coming in and him kind of putting his philosophy into what the team should be and, and what the putting demands on players if at the end of it they go for a manager to take over who will be completely different. Surely he should be coming in here now to set the base for what's going to come next. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think United are going to suddenly go and appoint someone like Louis van Gaal right, who plays that kind of football. They've made a decision. Fletcher and Murta have made a decision that the kind of football they want to play is fast, physical, attacking football. What what I guess United supporters know as United football. Mm. And so they've appointed, that's what Fletcher and Murta want. And, they've, and that was what they said that he wanted and couldn't quite deliver. And they've appointed someone who who is going to, who's going to inculcate that football throughout the club and who's going to be involved in the appointment of his successor, and that person is going to be someone who plays that kind of football too. I don't think, yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely certain that's what they're going to do now. Because you wonder as well, we United, and can, and like, it does, it makes absolute perfect sense for that to happen, but there's been no sense to a lot of, to a lot of what has happened over the last few years. So you, you kind of do wonder, like surely they would say, well, regardless of what you do in the six months, you're going to be a consultant for after this. Like, surely those conversations have been happening where they say... Even if it goes horribly wrong? Pardon me? Even if it goes horribly wrong? Because, you know, these, uh, well, these things don't, there's no tra- guarantee. I, mean, I, don't, I don't, honestly, like, I don't see how how, how much more horribly wrong you can go. <laughs> yeah, okay. like, say, you know, say, got, say it doesn't got... get any better then, right? Say it doesn't, say there's no improvement. Right, yeah. but, well, so they get Wallet 5 near the Anfield. They, I, I just, it just, it doesn't seem likely because it happens usually whenever you have, whenever, the, 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 all the managers post Fergie, whenever they've been fired, they've been fired at a point where you've more or less feel like it's not possible for anyone else to get any less out of this squad. And we've seen it with Michael Carrick. Michael Carrick has no, never been a manager before, but it was it got so bad under Ole that he's immediately found two better results and two performances with much more discipline in defending than before because it wasn't possible for it to get worse. And United have really good players. But so the to- idea... Sorry, the idea that it won't get better from here it just seems unlikely because those players are good. Mm. Sorry for coming across there. No, I think you know, this could be a really, really kind of almost seismic in terms of what how the future of Old Trafford will be shaped because, as you were saying, if John Morton and Darren Fletcher are saying, we want fast, dynamic, attacking football and this is the man who basically has created this culture in German football and if he can't get it out of these players in six months, well then, it's going to be clear for Old Trafford then that this is either going to be maybe a two-year project or it could be a ten-year project in terms of actually we need to get rid of a lot of players in this squad and they're going to that might sound a bit dramatic right but seriously it's true like, there's very good players in that Man United team but if Ranić actually cannot improve them and cannot get them to play to a level where they actually show some sort of basis to do it well then that is going to be serious problems because like the United have been it's been said for so long United are a team of say individuals who can create moments but so if if a manager of Ranić's calibre who has been able to mould clubs and create them in his vision or whatever you want to call it, can't deal with a, a, a calibre of players like this, well, then they're serious problems. Really, Yeah, of course. But, I mean, that's why they, they, they've appointed him because that's not what's meant to happen next. And there are, mm. there are so many good players that you would expect it to get better. The question would always be whether it can get better enough. And mm. that's the unknown. And you couldn't really say that for sure about about anyone uh, maybe Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola would be the only managers where you'd be certain that if you employed them then they would get you to a point a level at which you wanted to be and Guardiola even with Guardiola 
he's always had the best players in the league. In every league, in every job that he's had, he's always had the best players. And United don't currently have the best players. The question is whether Rannick is able to turn the potential into the best players. And I think the signs there, the portents are good because that is what he does. He'll obviously have to make some important signings as well. But they don't need that many signings. Um, there are loads of really good players in attack. It's kind of the back end of the team, the the defensive end of the team, where you wonder quite what he's going to make. And I'm sure that he'd be able to get performances out of Marcus Rashford and Mason Greenwood. Um, The question is whether he decides that he has defenders good enough to play the way he wants to play. And if he doesn't, then he is going to have to buy some because they're not there at the club. So I guess... Like Klopp, obviously, it took him a while to get going at Liverpool. He clearly came in and had immediate authority and knew that there was a long-term plan, but it wasn't like they surged up the table the first day he arrived in and it wasn't one training session and fixed everything. They, they, I'm just checking here. They finished eighth in the Premier League at the end of his first season. Now, granted, he didn't have the full season, but I'm just saying that it's possible that it takes a while for everything to uh, wash through. And Agree. I mean, I wrote this at the weekend that Rannick's got a decision to make about whether he comes in and just tries to change as little as possible for now whilst making it better, or whether he takes... That's a low-risk, low-reward approach, probably, or whether he really tries to impose everything that he wants now, which means it might, it might, get, it might not get better very quickly. But I think the difference with Klopp, and I think why, why Tuchel coming to Chelsea is a better comparison, is the quality of the players. United finished second last season. They got to the Europa League final. They're not. They're on, they, 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 they ended up on their ass very quickly. But this isn't the kind. It's not a massive rebuild in the way that Klopp turned up at Liverpool, and Liverpool were in a much worse condition than United were in terms of the players that they had, in terms of how well they were doing, and therefore, like imposing something different on them was a bigger job. For Rannick, he definitely has to impose a different style. He needs to get the players running more, but he's got young players who can run. So it is simply, it's simply a matter of of telling them to do it and making them do it. And if they don't do it, you leave them out and you replace them with the other good players that you have. I don't think Klopp quite had that. And I'm not saying that I expect Rannick to come in and immediately, like, the pressing triggers are all there and this, that and the other. And really, what Tuchel did at Chelsea, he did an amazing job. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he didn't do an amazing job. But ultimately, the first thing that he did was he made them very difficult to beat. Yeah. He played with three centre-backs, two wing, two wing-backs who were both defenders, and two midfielders in front of them. And then allowed the front players to win to win them games and it worked worked pretty well in the league not perfectly in the league and it worked well enough to make them champions of Europe now I'm not sure United have the defensive players that are good enough to exactly ape that but they absolutely have the attacking players to make sure they score a couple of goals in every game and they have good enough defensive players to be much more solid than they have and that's one of the reasons I always felt United were a decent threat in this season's Champions League because if they can just defend with some discipline, they have the firepower to beat anyone over two legs, I think. Let's talk about some of those individual players, right? Like, um, there were definitely some players who responded well to the Solskjaer era, and we saw Luke Shaw put in the best football of his career, although it has tailed off. Is there a possibility that the quality of coaching will just go up now to the point where suddenly players who have been cast off, like uh, Bailly, for example, or Martial, for example, can become competent squad players and contribute. Is that the the main hope here about how things could get better quickly? That individuals will will decide that I think Donny van de Beek might have a future all of a sudden. Um, I think I don't think it will happen for Martial. Partly because if United want to buy in January, he would be one of the most obvious players you would sell, get some money for. Because ultimately, he's not he's not better. There are, there are Rashford, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. And um, Mason Greenwood all, and Edison Cavani are all better than he is. It's just simply he's he's the fifth best attacker at United, and United have Anthony Langer coming through, who's also going to be a player. So I don't think it'll happen for Martial. But he's the more interesting one because when United bought him, he clearly had talent. He had a lot of the raw attributes that you would want in a centre back. He hadn't played that much football. Um, he hasn't doesn't appear to have been coached particularly well, but also he can't stay fit. So. He is one that you would definitely think there's something to work with. He is now old enough so that you feel that at his age, generally, the player you see is the player that there is. But he, I mean, as we saw on Sunday, he played pretty well on Sunday, but he, he, he just can't reliably stay fit. Like, Eric Bailly's top level is arguably makes him the second best defender at United, but his bottom level makes him the worst defender at United. And you're never sure what you're going to get with him. 
So it may be that Rannick turns up and thinks that he fancies him and can coax that his top level of performance out of him regularly and he can stay fit but those are some big ifs and ultimately if a decent offer came in for him and United needed the money to strengthen I'm pretty sure they'd take it OK what about somebody like Lindelof uh, like I guess is Harry Maguire undroppable uh, no I don't think so um, I think he'll I think he'll probably come back against Arsenal but I think that he may he was because he, he was all those choices captain, so that becomes slightly different. He's not Rannick's choices captain, so dropping him probably is a little bit less stressful for him. Um, I think that he def- if he doesn't play better, he will absolutely get dropped. I don't and didn't ever really think that he was quite as good a centre back as I wanted United to have um, centre backs who can't run, uh, elite level centre backs who can't run. That's not a very long list. There's Franco Baresi and then not that many others. Um, so I think that whenever you get a new manager, it's an opportunity for all the players. But similarly, all the players who are automatic choices are also under pressure. So if you look at the way Rannick likes to play, for example, is tends to like a 4-2-2-2. And the two behind the centre forwards tend to be wingers. Now, that means that finding Bruno Fernandes a spot is not easy. And he, he's going to someone, I mean, he's the best player in the team. Um, and he's someone who's going to need to earn his spot, probably, like, like everybody else. And so in that sense, it's a good challenge for all the players, and you'll see which players have got the stomach for it and which players don't. It, can he make Ronaldo press? Is that possible, that actually nobody's asked Ronaldo? You know, by the way, there's a style of play here. It will involve you doing this. Let's do I it. I don't think that when we talk about pressing, we don't necessarily mean charging about from defender to defender like Carlos Tevez. It can sometimes be a matter just of stand, like standing on your centre back, who has been marking you two minutes before, any, twenty seconds before anyway, or blocking a passing lane. It doesn't necessarily require a lot of sprinting from every player. It requires sprinting from some players and the team acting in concert. And so, I don't think that Cristiano Ronaldo is someone for whom it is impossible to press. He's not going to be sprinting out to the flanks chasing fullbacks. But I don't think that standing on a centre-back and blocking a passing lane is something that is beyond him, at e- even at his age. So you remember, wasn't it, the, one of those clips that came out from Ranjek about his philosophy, talking about it's either, you can't do a little bit of something, it's either, like a, there's no such thing as a little bit of pressing, it's like a little bit of pregnant. I thought yeah. that was a, a good line, it is. And it's like what you were saying earlier, Daniel, about the fact that, like, does he come in and change as little as possible to kind of maybe improve things, or rip things up I suppose and you get the sense even from reading about him and how he operates that it is all or nothing with him and that I know I think you're you're spot on in what you're saying there about say say Ronaldo it could just be as simple as splitting your centre backs and moving it a couple of yards over just to almost force the play to a to one position where then those lads are the ones who actually put in the, the harder yards it's just whether or yeah. not Ranyak kind of utilises that or actually and again coming back to what you were saying about realising that when you have an elite player when you have a player of who can change a game for you that you have to maybe adapt a little bit for, for that and I do think with United and with Ronaldo they are in that territory in the sense that like I think if he's there in the beginning you, you, I think you do have to play him and you do kind of operate around him because he is a player and where United are at at the moment where they still will rely on maybe at that moment actually seal the game like I don't buy into this thing of it was the right thing to do to drop him even though he got a draw against Chelsea because you never know how the game could have went if he was if he was there and it was obviously clear that Cardiff just didn't trust him the way they wanted to do it he hadn't got the they hadn't got the time to do to work on it enough where they could actually work with a system to keep Ronaldo in the team and still operate with that kind of bit more bit more pressure it's going to be up to Ranjek to have that Tuchel effect almost where he can do it really quickly and also like and this is where it comes into it when at a club like United, like the commercial side of things and the kind of stuff that's happening behind the scenes. If Ronaldo is is dropped to the bench for a few weeks, it's not long before it becomes it could become very messy. Like that's just how a club like United operates. I I don't think that that's gonna be a problem for now because there are so many games um for the next yeah, couple true, of months. Same, right, and he's just he's not gonna play them all because he's thirty six. So I don't I don't see that being a problem right now. I think the problem will always come with Ronaldo if the manager feels he can't pick him for the biggest games and that will start to attract attention but I don't think I don't think that's particularly that's necessarily likely at the beginning because I mean Carrick as we saw Carrick, I mean Carrick left him out against Chelsea because I think he just wanted to make sure that United didn't get beaten but United could easily have got beaten I actually felt like 
I didn't I didn't mind him leaving Ronaldo out particularly. I mean, I, I thought, but I thought that he shouldn't have brought him on when he did. Felt when he brought when he brought him on, things were actually going quite well. I mean, it seemed like Sancho had a knock, but it's, it, it felt like that actually wasn't. He, he didn't particularly help coming on in that game. But it's 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 a squad game, and you will always try and use all the players available to you that you think are good. And with Ronaldo, also, what Rannick likes the fullbacks high and wide. So if you've got the fullbacks high and wide. And you've got Ronaldo on the centre back, and you've got the other centre forward, and you've got the, another, and you've got at least one attacking midfield player, probably two. Then you've got enough to press there, and you've still got four players back. You've still got the two holding midfield pairs back, and the two centre backs back, and may, probably maybe one of the full backs too. So I don't think that it's impossible to press properly with Ronaldo at all. No. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that would be a problem. I think that. It might be that Rannick wants a bit more pace on the counter than you get from Ronaldo these days. And there's definitely a vision that I think most United supporters have that at some point in the not-too-distant future, you've got a front three of Rashford, Greenwood and Sancho. And I'm sure they'll be working towards that and maybe even thinking about a different centre-forward to buy. But Ronaldo isn't the future, but he's still the present, much yeah. as people would like to write him out of that. Uh, one last question for you. What is the? What have you heard about how many people Ranić is going to bring with him and, and the status of the people who are already there? Carrick, I, don't, I, I, I don't know about that. It does look like they're all going to somehow survive, um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure he'll want one or two to bring with him, but I don't know who they are. But the talk from people who say that they know seems to be that the jobs of those that are already there are safe. Okay. Well, it's interesting anyway. You sound excited by the whole thing. Um, I mean, it's always exciting when you get a new manager, unless that new manager was David Moyes. I definitely recall being unexcited by that one. And funny, because I remember always thinking in the back of my mind, it'd be quite exciting when Fergie goes to... Because it'd be the first time in uh, 20 years you think, what's going to happen? How wrong Careful you are. Um, how wrong you are. Yeah, and then, then they appointed Moyes, and it was just like, oh, now I know what's going to happen. And I, yeah. But all the other managers after Fergie, I was really interested to see how they did. And... Rannick is something different. He's something very different from what we've seen before. And I think that I think he's going to make it really interesting. And um, United, with United's combination now of talent, money, and um, and brain is something that that's something that's exciting for people to for, that's something for United supporters to watch and should make it very interesting at the top of the league. Probably not this season. Like the league's obviously gone. Um, United still in the hunt for fourth and they've got a run of games now which I mean I guess I always felt that if they were in the hunt for the title at when they at the after the end of the full time of the Arsenal game on Thursday then they'd have a really good chance of winning the league because the run they have now is one where you'd expect them to accumulate a lot of points obviously they're nowhere near the league but the run that they have now I still expect them to accumulate points that should put them in a decent with them with a decent chance of fourth and by the time the Champions League starts again uh, Rannick should have had a decent opportunity to get them playing how he wants and that is a cup competition I think it might take them a midfield to actually do some serious damage it might take a midfield player in January but that shouldn't be oh, the line's gone two. so the season the season is not over it's not where United wanted it to be but it should at least not be boring to watch the rest of it no for sure Daniel good stuff thanks a million for joining us cheers cheers see you guys everyone have a good day bye Daniel Harris giving us his thoughts there on uh, the appointment of Ralph Rannick um, when when Klopp said this is not good news for the rest of us I bought that like it, it was it wasn't him just uh, fluffing up a uh, mate or somebody mm-hmm. he likes it, it it seemed like it was legitimate and that's the first time that anybody's been able to say that about the situation at Man United for a while where they're like oh they've got some brain power over there that we're going to be interested to see what they can do yeah no it, it does seem as if they've got someone in place there who has a calibre and a kind of a track record of actually putting his impact and putting a stamp on a club and it's kind of what you know you'd have needed it's kind of you, you kind of be wary though of falling into the trap of well because because he has this way of playing and does want to do it one way oh well that's it everything's solved that's what's going to happen now everything's going to he's going to be able to do this like we have seen with this group of players that yeah it might happen in the short term but pr- for a prolonged period are they actually capable you mentioned Harry Maguire like if you're going off the back of say last season I would have said Harry Maguire was undroppable I thought the way he was actually carrying himself in the team the performance that he was putting in even though yeah he does kind of turn like a double legger bus at times he was actually he did sense as if he was kind of having a really kind of sense of leadership in that team and then you saw when he picked up his injury 
how United kind of faded a little bit when he wasn't there. Then he goes to the Euros, which are kind of thinking clearly. I don't think he was fit to go and properly and be be there. Has a, a has a long summer there, and then this season his form he just has 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 fallen off, fallen off a cliff. The same has happened with with Luke Shaw, which which you mentioned. There's just too many players who don't seem capable of maintaining the consistency levels for a for a team that new need, do need to be at the kind of the very top. And they like, go making this point before that what's happened this season with United has obviously been has been dreadful essentially but it almost got back to that point last year where United were top of the league in January and were playing well and it wasn't as if it wasn't as if that they went through just a really tough run of fixtures or went through an injury crisis they just mentally were not capable of sustaining a title challenge with those players last year they brought in obviously Ronaldo and Varane but then problems have escalated I'd almost go back to saying that the fact of how United faded so badly last year when they were in a pretty strong position kind of highlighted where where the real issues were and that mentality of actually going and winning because for some of these players it does feel as if just being at Man United is enough and they talk about oh well we want to do this and we want to win that but the fact is some of these players haven't won anything in their career No and it, you definitely feel like the squad has been put together on a very ad hoc basis as opposed to with an overarching style of play and maybe that's the difference that's going to happen if they continue to invest at the level they've invested in in the last five years over the next five years but they do it with a plan in place with Rania, yeah that, well that's when that's when what Klopp was saying then you would worry about for, for the rest in terms of the finances that are there but I do think as well with some of the players and I think it'll become clear as well I just think mentality was I just don't think they have it like they're clearly they wouldn't be there if they hadn't got talent every player in the Premier League and it, at that level as well it clearly has it but that ability like players who are going to win your stuff on a consistent basis and are going to be delivering don't go through periods like they've been been through over the last few months like. but how much of that is down to the coaching and the expectations like I, I do wonder if I think on the pitch though I think sometimes on a pitch a group of players know a group of players are who have I just who have a bit more not so much a pride about them but just an understanding of of how of at the very top of how not to get barred well, <laughs> you know what I mean think, like, if you were at the very very top like if the, that doesn't happen for a prolonged gone, period it's gone you know at that stage the, the, the battering is as a result of what's happened over the previous the like, tiny little shortcuts that got taken one matter getting a new contract yeah what was that about has he even played this year I, I think he was on the bench and he might have played like he's, he's definitely he came on as a sub recently enough I was like what, what? Well, is wasn't, that about? wasn't like one of those lions that has come out whenever that has like protecting the value of an asset and stuff but sure what matter he's, he's great around the club you know and he's, he seems like a really good human being yeah. but it's a very expensive mascot to have around as opposed to so the standards slip to the point where it's like well this squad is just like there's a million people here Who's, well, even the, who's even the, playing? What are we all doing? Yeah, even the goalkeeping department wasn't there. Like, you look at the Hay, like the highest paid goalkeeper in in the world. You have. I say I would say they've probably got the highest paid sub goalkeeper yeah. in the world. And maybe maybe Kepa now is getting paid more. And it was interesting as well, though, as well that was, even when all the stuff was coming out about Ranić, the fact that there was talk about Henderson then being one who would be allowed to would be allowed to leave. I don't know. Again, I said that earlier, but like, I do think I think the next six months or so for Renyek especially because he has this consultancy in terms of players I think this is going to be this is the term and he'll say listen if you want to go down this route of how I play Let's football with away. the next manager well this happen, needs to happen yeah. straight away I would say but, yeah. but then will he do that because he can't just get rid of a whole squad or half a squad in one window or it's going to be a gradual thing that's why I was saying this could be something that he will say if, if this is a person who they have the utmost respect for which he seems I remember reading that story about John Moore to going over to Germany and like yeah. essentially he was interviewing for the job just to have a three years ago though yeah exactly yeah. And, but then he Morta would have been in a position then where he wasn't the one making the decisions you know no, it was, it was Ed Woodward. forward planning you know yeah. so like the fact that it does seem maybe feel a little bit as if Morta who will be taking on this director obviously he's director of football or football director it does feel as if for me he's got his man to actually bring this forward that's why I think now we, United will know how long this project is going to actually take if they're intent on going down the way of, of playing how Ranyak wants to with whoever the next manager is Yeah, and if you do think that then there are, it's not that you're getting rid of players in the squad it's just that there are a bunch of players who don't fit your prototype anymore and so you don't need them mm. it's not like they're they're going to in a, in a pinch in an injury crisis you're going to turn to them and they're going to save you because they're playing the wrong football or they can't do the job that you're asking them to do so you're better off if Pogba doesn't fit that style that you want you're better off him not being there 
and being in the changing room. If mm. Jay Lings doesn't fit, or if he does fit, then stick him in the team. But if he doesn't fit, take the money now and get rid. And so, you know, you, you play with a small squad for the rest of the year, but all of a sudden, there's like loads of room in that squad for good players to come in. And um, I don't know, I was looking at transfer fees, right? So, Arwan Bissaka, 49.5 million in July 2019 is what Man United paid for him. And in August 2019, Xiao Cancelo cost 58 million. And it's an extra eight or nine million. And the difference in quality of, of output now from the two players. But I think that that's to do with coaching. And I think, that's, I think that Arwan Bissaka could be a player. It'll be very interesting to see if he's a player in this. But also, you look at where those two players would have been at in their respective careers when they were bought as well. Like Kinsella would have been at Juventus, would have been successful there, would have like, w- would have won stuff. But also, when he was being bought, he was getting going into a system where straight away where he knew where how, how where Guardiola knew how he was going in. But then also kind of changed. Remember, I don't think he's done that as much this season. I could be wrong, but like remember last year he was kind of playing almost in central th- midfield, th- th- yeah, the Philip Lamb style kind of I can play in this position in this position and like yeah. I don't think Warren, Warren Wan Bissaka like, is stepping in yeah and it's but. it's always it is fair it's it's kind of hard when you do pick out say individuals but it's hard not to when you see some of the perform, individual performances but I think well they could point, pick five or six more is the problem that's the, that's the issue and like, the fact that obviously I think what was quite telling was the fact that Renyek said most importantly working as a team do you know what I mean that unit like I think a player like Wan Bissaka you see so many of his lim- limitations because he's not working maybe in a system that can protect him a bit more He's kind of expected to do stuff that he shouldn't be expected. No, like realistically, like what's he doing crossing the halfway line? Like if he's a defender, like will so like with Ranić, what's Ranić going to see him? Will he say, well, do you know what? This is you're going to fit in absolutely perfectly, but but doing a specific job. If you're looking at a high press or he could be centre back, back. Like he would be ideal. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, maybe. So, like, yeah. He he's someone who he sees. It's someone interesting like, to see how they turn him into a player or decide to go right. We're gonna. You're going to be a squad player. You yeah. you can be a squad player, but you're not a first teamer. And he's played so much football as well. This is another thing. Like he's played nearly. I think he's played every game in the league and all this year because he's yeah. no one else. You know, like, like, and his confidence could be low as well. And because there was times where he did look as if he was actually developing a bit last year yeah. and was getting a bit better. But yeah. then because of everything that's happened around him and he's still a young lad, it's just confidence is on the floor. So you, like, there's still it's not all doom and gloom there, especially if you have a coach like who could come in. and don't know who his staff are going to be if if Carrick and McKenna are going to be hanging on and, and Mike Phelan. So interesting to see definitely yeah. 27 minutes past 8 this morning here on OTBAM we're live with Gillette proud sponsors of Movember Gentlemen Let's Mow uh, we are going to speak with Stephen O'Donnell a little bit later on we're going to preview the Irish Women's National Team World Cup qualifier tonight against Georgia up next it's the Tuesday Papers OTB AM this is OTB Sports Radio have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast if not, here's some of what you've missed over the last week. I often wonder, is Keane almost venting frustrations on behalf of his friend in that regard? I don't want to say he's got a blind spot to Solskjaer, but he's another former teammate who hasn't exactly kind of criticised him. And while we're getting carried away, Joe, Jason Knight reminds me a little bit of young Roy Keane. But while we're in full buzz at the moment, I think I'll just throw that in there and, and heap unnecessary pressure on his shoulders. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. OTB AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. Eight minutes past eight this morning here on OTBAM. You're very welcome. If you've just joined us, then you've missed us talking with Daniel Harris. You can get that back on the podcast. Uh, subscribe on the OTB Sports app. And um, I think most of our issues with podcasting on the iOS platform have been resolved. If uh, you are still having any problems, then get in touch and hopefully we should be able to explain to you uh, a way around it. We've got a little cheat going at the moment. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring you through the newspaper headlines. We can start with uh, otbsports.com. Tiger Woods says he won't return full-time and he feared losing his legs. This is after the, the uh, single-person car accident that he was in last year. Ranić should wage war on Manchester United players. It's Pat Nevin, who uh, is all oh, war, war, no Jojo. Uh, Davy Fitz confirms Cork Camogie coaching role. Um, so that's good for... Uh, attention and clicks Harry Byrne needs to show more for Leinster if he is to stay in the Ireland squad that's the headline from Monday Night Rugby and Bowes condemned tiny minority for Irish Town trouble ahead of cup final which is a story that's actually evolved over the last uh, 24 hours or so um, the Irish Times done a bit of digging on it you've been doing a bit of digging on it too yeah, there was a, like the story when the in the Irish Times was talking about that there could be links to like say English fans who have links to Bohemians. Yeah, so who, who were over, which is a bit. Conor Gallagher is their crime correspondent, I think. I don't want to do this as a disservice, and I saw I read it online. I haven't got it in the paper at the moment. Um, but the story was, 
So if anybody missed this, right, there was a, a St. Patrick's Athletic fan gathering in Irish Town House, in Irish Town, funnily enough, and um, it got attacked by people dressed all in black. Yeah, like one of the paragraphs here is that a Garda investigation is ongoing and no arrests have been made. Garda believe the majority of the violence was not carried out by Bohemians fans, but rather by a group who had travelled over from the UK. Members of this group are believed to be supporters of a UK team which has long-standing association with Bohemians. Right. I had no idea that any uh, UK team, it says. Yeah, it's a, stra- it's a strange one because like, I remember, obviously, pre-COVID, it would be quite regular. You would see kind of groups of fans or groups of lads at maybe, say, Daly Mount Park or even Richmond Park. Like St. Pat's, like St. Pat's would have a link. It's a strange one to a fan. He's probably passed away with, say, with Sheffield United. In terms of like, they would go over and there would be kind of a bit of a bit of a bond there. They would have drinks and all the rest of it, and you'd see a few of them. Like I'm not, I'm, there's nothing official. It's just a thing that happens. Yeah, fan groups meet fan groups. I think there could have been a family link in there as well, which is obviously natural as well. And like I remember actually going over to Sheffield, Sheffield United, and outside the ground they have like a building block, and his name is Hanno, the fellow, the Pat's fan who passed away sadly, and. Um, but there's actually a, a kind of a, one of the blocks is like a mural to him or kind of outside Bramall Lane. So I'm not, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% certain. I've heard a different club, of, a club mentioned of who it could be, but you don't know what the situation is. And it just seems absolutely, absolutely bizarre that like a group of people would come over from the UK. And you, let's be honest, like the current correspondent from the Irish Times isn't going to be writing this if, if, he has, if it's not well sourced and there's not solid information behind it. So... It kind of does shed another light on on, on what's happened, you know. Yeah, it's also it's interesting as well that um, the Gardaí are being criticised here. Uh, it took at least ten minutes for the Gardaí to arrive, by which time the violence had stopped. And um, there was a piece, certainly in the online uh, version last night, that said that Gardaí were annoyed at the fact that such a small crew had been put on. There was only a skeleton crew of public order Gardaí on duty for the FAI Cup final between Bowes and Pats. As I said, this is Conor Gallagher, the crime correspondent, the Irish Times piece which saw significant violence near the stadium. There was only about a dozen dedicated public order guardy on duty, despite the fact there was 37,000 fans at the stadium. Uh, previous games between the teams have attracted significantly more policing resources. Previous games, bear that in mind. And this is, they've never played in a cup final. This is the biggest game ever. So what was going on? Why weren't there more cops? It is very, you would, th- you would think that because of the nature of the fact that it's a Viva Stadium, it's a cup final, and that there was going to be close to 40,000 people there, that naturally... I don't know, even by law, would there have to be a certain amount of resources put into it by police? In terms of the, like, the previous games, I, 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 James, I've been going to ma- ma- matches at, at Richmond Park between Bowes, and, or between Pats and Bowes, probably since I was nine, year, nine years of age, and, and even growing up, like there's an edge, obviously, to the games. It's a Dublin derby, but I can't remember ever seeing actual violence between between groups of fans, especially not violence in, t- in the sense of where it's organised and, and arranged. Do you know what I mean? It's not... It's genuinely not something that's part of, of a culture, especially in that fixture. Like, it could be... Like, I know there's different grades. Like, I said, let's be honest, everyone knows that there's a far more of an edge of a derby between Rovers and Bowes and the, nat- and the nature of that. And you go to a game and you do get that sense. Like, I was, I was covering the game on Sunday and got the, tra- got the, the train in from the Navarro Parkway into Connolly Station, was milling about town for a bit, in and around the station there, got to the Aviva, and fans were, mi- like, mixing, even in the stadium, sitting beside her, but fans were mixing all day. And at no point... You, you you would see guards obviously about, but it didn't feel as if it was that kind of an occasion. Yeah. There wasn't that undercurrent or a sense of there was going to be trouble. And then you saw that video that went was doing the rounds on social media, and you are just obviously appalled. You're like, what what what, what is this? Like, it didn't make any sense. Yeah. Like we were getting we were getting criticised by a lot of people watching the show yesterday. Oh, you need to call this what it is. It just didn't make it. Did, if it had been a bunch of lads dressed in bows, gear and... Uh, but that, the thing is with football like, hooliganism as well, you you won't get lads dressed in fan colours doing it, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you, you've like, seen the, the Man United Leeds videos that did the rounds after that game where it was clear they were fans from the two sides who were clashing in the city centre and walking past, people were having their lunch walking out, looking mm-hmm. out. And it's like, that. this seemed orchestrated. There was a, a group of people who were in a uniform mm. but not a team uniform it, was, it just seemed weird what, what's it, what I found more strange about it was that it was orchestrated purely from one side in the sense that this was a group of people who had decided we're going to attack this pub that's f- filled with um, young young kids with families women their husbands their children like those kids in there who obviously had been had, had been hurt but it was from one side. This wasn't a group of fans from both sides who arranging to meet up. Who absolutely despise each other. We're going to show where, like, we're the hard men. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Like it was, it was done uh, f- f- from one end. And this story now that's in the Irish Times, 
well, obviously now that's, that's, that adds a, a totally d- a different complexion yeah. on this story. Yeah, it does. It definitely does. And you'd hope that um, the Guardi are in, in contact with the uh, police service in the UK to find out a bit more about this and to get some intelligence on it. So just to very quickly, because re- 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 here's the exact paragraph. The lack of dedicated public order officers for the game has also caused anger among Guardi. The lack of officers meant none of the public order tactics to combat disturbances could be used, one source said. So a well-sourced story by and Conor Gallagher here saying that the cops were pissed off that there weren't more cops mm-hmm. on, which you almost never get. I actually had that from a, a friend of mine who was a, a member of the Guardian. and he, he, he even though he brought his kids into the game and he kind of had noticed that there was significantly le- fewer members around than you w- p- was expecting. Right. But there's actually an, sorry, just an interesting point I just spotted here in, in Dan McDonnell of uh, this parish as well. In the end though, like he was just obviously doing kind of like just a commenty piece on it and stuff but he also says here like perhaps regular League of Ireland attendees can be a bit desensitised to the occasional bit of aggro that it's true that Dublin derbies have been graced by the presence of UK hooligans attracting the basis of tenuous alliances with clubs here and there are reports suggesting this element had a part to play on Sunday so that's another kind of element to it too. yeah yeah okay so that's interesting we'll keep a close eye on that John Duggan is with us at 8.35 this morning John good morning to you Ger and David how are we getting on what's going on so much you want we can talk about um like there's that story, that statement from Bohemians, which was interesting to see, and the, and the information you've just given there about this, uh, um, I would say, murky uh, group that after coming in from the UK, that that, that kind of just like bringing to my mind uh, what happened in 1995, you know, at a much larger scale, but uh, in 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 Dublin for that England game. But let's host the World Cup, right? Let's let's. Well, with the new stadium and let's put all our. Where's the new stadiums in Meath, isn't it? Time and energy and resources into. Um, yeah. Uh, there's so much we could talk about. Liam Sheedy going to Monaghan. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. Yeah, back page in though, yeah. I missed this. Uh, yeah, Liam Sheedy's going to be part of uh, Banty's backroom team uh, for next season. We all, they already have Donny Buckley in there as coach, and maybe this could be the moment where Monaghan and Shane Hannan and, and all these uh, Farney Army uh, cross the Rubicon of winning that All-Ireland. Liam Sheedy is he the secret sauce under Banty and uh, Donny Buckley to win that All-Ireland for Monaghan. They only lost by point to Tyrone this year in Ulster. Uh, so that's the back page of the Indo, yeah, today. So In Croker as well. Wasn't that the Ulster final was in Croker? That's right, yeah. I was in Connemara at the time. Um, the FAI speaking to Stephen Kenny through his agent, apparently, uh, according to the Irish Times. So the news, it was, it was a non-statement, really, that they met the board yesterday and they're going to chat now to Stephen Kenny and they're going to decide whether to offer him uh, an interim deal until next October or that deal for the, to cover the Euros. Um, the Ireland women playing tonight, as we know, 7 o'clock against Georgia. They have to win the game to be second to the group at the end of the year um, after the Slovakia setback. Munster still in Cape Town, trying to get back, touch and go, whether they'll be able to fulfil that game against Wasps on Sunday week in Coventry. Um, also, we have Lionel Messi winning the Ballon d'Or. Uh, Lewandowski probably hard done by, I would say, to finish second. Jorginho third. Uh, Norwich uh, going to Newcastle tonight in the Premier League. Leeds against Crystal Palace. Gordon Elliott saying that... Um, you know, he learned about himself and a lot of other people um, over the last year. And he's been speaking ahead of the Leperstown Christmas Festival. Pogba stories, which I hate to see on the back page uh, of the Mirror and the, uh, I think, and the Herald as well. Go. Don't we all? Just absolutely hate to see them. And, uh, but a couple of interesting stories here, Woods and Taylor. So Tiger Woods and Katie Taylor. So Woods did an interview with Golf Digest because uh, he's hosting the Hero World Challenge this week and revealed that he nearly lost one of his legs in that serious car accident back in February. Just going to give some of the quotes here. Uh, I don't have to compete and play against the best players in the world. To have a great life, after my back fusion, I had to climb Mount Everest one more time. I had to do it, and I did. This time around, I don't think I've got the body to climb Mount Everest, and that's okay. I can still participate in the game of golf. I can still, if my leg gets okay, I can still click off a tournament here or there. But as far as climbing the mountain again and getting all the way to the top, I don't think that's a realistic expectation of me. He's going to pick and choose a few tournaments a year. But our days of seeing Tiger Woods regularly playing PGA golf and playing in the majors are over. I, I think this is to be expected. The, the fact that um, he's talking about playing, he's going to play in the majors, is he? Uh, well, he can always, he, he can play in the Masters, he can play in the Open. Um, he's got 82 tours wins, and which is funny enough tied with Sam Snead. Maybe that is one of his last motivations is to win another PGA Tour event. But there'll be a handful of events, probably the majors, I would expect. But the problem is you can't just turn up in the majors and deliver. Mm. Um, he wouldn't be sharp enough to do that. So 
Uh, yeah, British a, Open, one of those tricky, tricky yeah, courses. He'd be grand. Big the little stinger shot, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, yeah. the way that career has gone and the trajectory in terms of, and even the, the recovery and the comeback and how he'd won the Masters, and you were thinking this could be a final thing for him. You wouldn't pull past him, maybe just doing one more to, to get over, because it's actually been incredible what's happened over the last few years and that resurgence that he had when you did it. Everyone thought maybe he was finished already. Yeah, the four back surgeries and coming yeah. back in the Masters in 2019, yeah. one of the greatest stories. And there's a bit of sadness I can even feel this morning because. Uh, to see Woods in his prime and to see Messi in Messi's prime, um, one of my great regrets in sports is never going to Barcelona 10 years ago and seeing Messi. Uh, that's one of my great regrets. And I just hope there's another Woods and another Messi around. But when you kind of look at their greatness, you kind of... Do you? Uh, I kind of hope there isn't. That we read the best of it and that's it. Mm. Time <laughs> it's over. You we, don't, we don't want you next generation to have many... much better in our day, John. Yeah. Well, I went, I went to see Messi play once in Rome in the Champions League final and I left the stadium coursing him. So it's not as great as you think to go and see him play. <laughs> Are you a Man United fan? Yeah. Ah, right. Well then, I mean, in fairness though, that's like, that was one of his, like, yeah. virtual... That's the header. The header, that yeah. header yeah. Ah, look, that's... I mean, you're blessed to have seen that though, right? Oh, yeah, I loved it, yeah. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I saw Messi miss a penalty at the World Cup, which was, uh, I've, I've never seen the pressure on somebody's shoulders like I saw Messi against mm. Iceland that day. Uh, so I was lucky enough to see that, I suppose. Uh, Katie Taylor, um, done an interview with Donald McRae. We always know that Donald McRae is such a great rider of boxing. Uh, so she's playing, uh, well, not playing, but she's fighting uh, Feruza Sharapova in Liverpool on Saturday week. Uh, just some of the quotes. Um, this is about her relationship with her dad, Pete. Uh, it's like a lifetime ago now, she says, but I felt like I was missing my right arm because I hadn't boxed without my dad in the corner. She was in such turmoil, this is what Donald McRae writes, that while her teammates in the 2016 Irish squad returned to their hotel, Taylor chose sometimes to sleep in her car. I would have thought it was too close to the training session to travel back an hour from the hotel to the training centre, so I slept in the car, she's quoted. It was probably not a great decision. And she talks about her grandmother, who's 89 and is watching her bouts. My granny is the most generous and soft-hearted person you could meet. My mam is the exact same, such a strong person. She's the reason why we grew believers in God and she brought us to church. I guess my parents would have the biggest influence in my life growing up, but I'm the person that I am today because of my grand. So I suppose the talk about Katie Taylor is after 19 unbeaten fights, will she fight Amanda Serrano next year? And they're talking that they both could earn a million dollars out of the fight if it does happen. There's two, there's two fights for her to get through. There's, or is it two fights for her to get through or two fights to happen before that I'm happens? I'm not sure. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, but, but certainly there's a, there's a bit of negotiation to be done and they've got to get to the point where they can... I don't know why they don't just fast forward that and go, let's fight, let's get it on. Yeah. Um, like... Before, um, if there's a million quid in it for them each. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I was there in uh, Rio and the devastation on Katie Taylor's face and her mother was there with her when she lost that bad controversy in the quarterfinal and it's in almost like it was in an industrial estate in a tent and you go from there five years later and you've got to give Eddie Hearn a lot of credit for getting behind her and, and obviously backing her talent and understanding that Katie Taylor uh, brought women's boxing into the uh, public domain, really, in amateur sport, and then she's done the same now in, in professional women's boxing. But it's amazing from there to here, and this is also an indication, like, a bit like Tiger Woods, you don't give up, you just keep going if you have the ability. You know? And I think with Eddie Hearn as well, I think he realised as much as that as well that there was a following there for him, for, for her. And yeah. that obviously, like, there was a talent there, everyone knows the talent's there, but like in professional boxing, essentially, like, if you're not going to be making the person money who's organising the fights, you're not going to get those fights, are you? No. Am I just being a bit cynical there? The fact I think you realise that Katie Taylor, like we always say, kind of almost transcends it in terms of the level that she's at and the kind of the aura about her. I think that he realised that there was money to be made from putting Katie Taylor front and centre. I think as well that there's like a, a confluence of time and if you look at how just generally the investment that's been made in women's sport that everybody wanted to see this and she she's come along at exactly the right time with the, the talent, the uh, skill set and the style that actually everybody wants to yeah. watch so um, it, it's kind of a confluence of opportunity and uh, timing really yeah that's what I would say so they are the kind of main things today and uh, what did you take away from the interview with Katie Taylor sleeping in her car uh, I thought that was interesting a uh, revelation that uh, she was doing that because of whatever situation she was in at the time and and also, you know, you're so locked in, I suppose, to the the heat of what you're involved in that I think maybe in the amateur game was different back then. And the expectation of being an Olympic champion, having to go and repeat in 2016 and going to Rio and doing that. And now as a professional, I'm sure it's all there. She's what's been living in Connecticut, hasn't she? And all the training's there and all the coaches are there and everybody's in her corner and it's Brian Peters and that kind of thing. So the support network, I suppose, is what I took out of the interview that her support network is so crucial to her and that's changed obviously in the last few years and now it's her mother and her grandmother and uh, 
that is, even at the top, is important to have that support network. All right, that's the Donald McRae interview. It's in The Guardian today. It's also carried in The Examiner. John, good stuff. Thanks All right, folks. Take care of yourselves. It's 8.44 this morning here on OTBM. We're live with Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, let's mow. Um, Ireland face Georgia. Massive game tonight, obviously. Here's Nathan Murphy catching up with Louise Quinn at full time after our disappointing draw with Slovakia the other night. Louise, I think most people coming here tonight were, were expecting all three points. Maybe they were expecting Slovakia to be a, a pushover. It certainly wasn't the case. No, absolutely not. And, and we didn't go into the game thinking that either. You know, we've been obviously watching the footage of them and they are a very, very composed team in possession and brilliant on the counter-attack and they get a lot of bodies forward when they do it and they're, they're just really direct. Um, you know, and to, we really had to kind of keep ourselves solid at those times and sometimes we weren't it was a little bit shaky um, you know so we we want to be better I think we obviously were trying to get forward and to and to get that goal um, you know created those chances um, you know it was it was a really really tough game it, it felt a bit frantic the whole way through that maybe Ireland never got, quite got the control particularly midfield that you would have wanted or maybe would have expected yeah I think I'd agree it was just a little bit we just needed to to calm it down um, in moments you know and I think kind of just starting to feel that pressure because again we'd be disappointed with the goal that we conceded directly after the half um, you know just kind of yeah not switched on I would say and you know and that's that is it's disappointing so you're trying to really really build yourself back in improve on the first half um, you know which we then kind of finally got ourselves into obviously Katie stepping up doing what she does um, you know and, and we did create the chances but it was you know, it was usually that, and sometimes you know I kind of I head up top, but it was we had to keep it secure at the back, to be honest. The pressure around this game was very different from the two games. Just try and nick something, and likewise against Finland, that they would try and get on the ball a lot. The expectation tonight was that Ireland would try and really take the game. Mm. Was that a, a difficulty for the team when you actually get on the pitch? That bit of pressure, that bit of composure. Is that is that just experience, or what do you put it down to? Yeah, again, yeah, experience of how to of how to take control of those games with a bit more possession. We knew it was still going to be one where, you know, they were actually going to really go for us and put a lot of pressure on. They close the ball very fast. When they're in possession, they create lovely little triangles. Um, you know, so again, it wasn't for us obviously going into it, yeah, of of what Slovakia maybe used to be, you know, a few years ago. But they've made massive improvements. Um, yeah. You know, and it, and it really shows. Um, so yeah, we for both ourselves, we've got to impose our game and just be composed and, and do what we're good at. And we just didn't do that up to enough quality today. It was a point. Uh, it could have been worse. You made the most miraculous goal line clearance. I'm not sure how much you knew about it. <laughs> no, I just knew to go get myself on the line, um, you know, and then yeah, hope to God it hit me and and it did, um, you know, and and that's yeah, that's in there for just to just to react to that and to. Yeah, to keep us in the game, um, and thankfully, thankfully, I was able to do that. We all sort of know the expectations around this group that Sweden should win it, and then it's a battle between Ireland and mm. Finland. And this point means that, you know, still in your own hands, is that sort of the message that when the players are even getting together there, that like Tuesday is another massive game that, as much as there's disappointment, mm. you can't let this linger. No, absolutely not. I think it's just going to to put the fire in us, to be honest, to know that we have to be better, we can be better. Um, Again, impose our game, be, be confident on the ball, believe what we're doing. Um, you know, everyone to want this because, you know, the capabilities, everyone we have in this squad is so capable. Um, you know, and that's, that's also the tough thing with international football. You get a very short amount of time to kind of bring that together at the same time. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to work, work fast and work hard. Um, you know, and just some things just didn't, didn't come on today. But, yeah, listen, we've... We got ourselves back in the game, and we and we kept the point, and that was that was really important, and it still keeps us in us absolutely. Yeah, the important thing now is you don't get pneumonia, so I get in quick. You too. <laughs> get, get in. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, Louise Quinn talking with Nathan in the aftermath of a disappointing performance and results against Slovakia. It just felt like a bit of a sickener, didn't you? Because there's so much momentum has been building up over the last little while, and the previous camp as well, getting that result against Finland, and obviously the performance against Sweden, and it just the the. The big important thing for them is that maybe it came in the middle rather than say at the end of what happened previously when they had that horrible result down in the Ukraine, wasn't it? Where yeah. they just they just kind of 
I think maybe as well on had been pointed is, is there still a bit of a hangover is that maybe still in the in the psyche a little bit I think maybe very, very power needs to get that out, out of them like but like you, you could listen to Louise Quinn there and she was kind of a little bit down a little bit downbeat and then obviously can be a bit more positive because like this game like they, they have to win like I know Vera Pell said it's a must win game and I think she's kind of saying that I'm guessing because she knows that they will win like I don't think they, she will be putting <laughs> any undue added yeah, pressure okay. surely like it's true though you know well. like and yeah. like, the, the other team they not, haven't scored a goal they haven't got a, haven't got a point they're at home like, they're the worst team in the group by a mile yeah. they're getting hammered by the other teams in the group and also Ireland are a, are a good team it's not as if that like I know obviously they struggled in the last game but like, they've got quality like they've got Katie McCabe like Denise O'Sullivan that's in there like they should be more than capable of being that little bit of patience because I thought it was quite interesting before um, last week's game where Vera Pell was talking about the need to be able to still play at a high tempo and to try and impose a game on them but also being patient and not getting frustrated if maybe things don't happen for them straight away and I think this is going to be another test of whether or not the players have that because and obviously don't get me wrong it's an early goal and you you would expect the floodgates to maybe open a little bit or maybe just the, the pressure to ease and it's like like, and like the longer it goes where if, if things are frustrating that's when maybe some of the other issues that have been there could could circulate in a little bit and it could be a bit more of a tricky night but I just I don't see it happening considering what, where, where, they're, where the t- both respective teams are at There's been a big debate about um, what the best use of our best players is and whether or not having Katie McCabe at left back like she is for Arsenal mm-hmm. is right for Ireland if actually we don't have the same resources that Arsenal do and so therefore that is unnecessarily uh, sidelining her literally and, and metaphorically from the game plan is tonight an opportunity to maybe see what it would look like if she was playing in a number 10 role or an advanced midfield role and not just do the same thing like, yeah um, like one of the points like even with, with, Kate, with, with Katie McKay I thought it was quite interesting like even when she was talking about this as, as an Arsenal player like she'd be big into her stats and how and her running stats and also kind of that high in, like kind of the high intensity but in the short bursts and she kind of says that she's able to impact the game when she's not just going side to side but can actually penetrate and that's how she knows that she can have an impact and I think if that's the case well then you get, you get her into into a position on the pitch where she knows that she's going to be most capable of actually impacting and you saw her goal very, like, just great finish as well Yeah, you, you do have to get her in those positions and I don't think necessarily anymore with a team that that necessarily means oh well the, she has to play maybe as a as a 10 or a 4 or four or forward if she's in that position where that she's used to playing with Arsenal and knows when she can actually get forward and when she can advance and make those impacts that's that's I think that's how you do get the best out of her I don't think you have to change too much especially if if she sees her best way of impacting a game is by doing it from that position How do you think Vera Powell's doing at the moment? Similar to Stephen Kane in the sense that you get the feeling that the players do all back and believe in what um, in what she's doing, and you see the excitement that does is around the women's game. Obviously, that's, I think that's coming as well. And you see what's happening with say the, the say some of the sponsorships that are around and the increased publicity. But I think I think it was maybe clever in, in a way of playing those high, the the high profile friendly games. Even though they went on that on that losing run, they were kind of playing a caliber of team. That they kind of needed to needed to be up against. Like, let's be honest. Like, if they, if they win the game, which they they should, they're going to be second in the group. They're going to be in the playoff spot. They're going to be where they should be. So, in that regard, she's she's doing well. Again, it comes down to at the end of the campaign. That's when you will judge of how things go because this should this win, even though that was a disappointment against against Slovakia, they can still end the campaign where they were expecting to end it and in second place. They might not have a bit more of a buffer there in terms of their of their points but it then sets them up going into into um, next year with the four games the f- with the finishing that well actually that's when you'll know if she's been doing a good job and can see it through if they actually do finish in second place which would be a, tr- a tremendous achievement yeah the, the disappointment is that we, we're not going to get to go back into a game against the Swedes where the winning of the group is is likely up for grabs because of what happened against Slovakia the last day you can't really drop points in the group with Sweden there mm. Um, and the likelihood of Sweden at home would beat us and that'd be stronger considering they were stronger than us when we played in, in Dublin but it'd be nice just to be at that level wouldn't it where there's a it's guaranteed you're going to finish second but you're actually mm-hmm. playing for the top of the group but that that takes a while as well to, uh, to achieve it's, it's it, true it, it does and even the structures as well it's very similar in terms of obviously players playing in say the WSL in, in England like the fact that like there's players obviously who would come through say in Ireland who are playing abroad in, in, in America there is kind of it's not as if there's like one kind of pathway through and, and the structure is through. Like it's going to take a while to to develop. And I think at the end of this campaign, if Ireland if Ireland do finish second and get through it, and 
learn from almost like what happened at the end of the last campaign, learn from almost like what happened in Slovakia. That's the stuff that you would hope will stand to them. And it does look in someone like Katie McCabe that you've got a player who, she's not there already, is very, very quickly, even at, at club level as well, is going to be a world-class player and could be someone who will be a serious focal point over the world. She's already captain, so like, yeah. you, you would expect the horse ceiling, I don't think, has been reached. No, and even, even her story... Um like she had a very significant setback, went over to England uh, relatively young, didn't make it at Arsenal at the start. They loan her out and then she goes and gets game time in an environment where they're like, you're really good and she's successful and then goes back. And even then it's touch and go whether or not she's going to get in the team. And then like it, it isn't as straightforward. These players, well, they're going to go, they're going to play this amount of football, they're going to be successful and they'll be in the national squad. So um, maybe we should temper our expectations and I shouldn't be talking about trying to win the group. Finishing second would be great. Especially with Sweden in our league in the group as well. But yeah. No, I think I don't think it's I don't think it's a bad thing when there are expectations there because the, like the players need that and also when you have a group of players who are who are, have been maybe developed a little bit and coming through together too, like they'll have those expectations. You know what I mean? Like I don't I think Ireland haven't qualified for a major tournament, but like it does feel as if with how things are going that they are on the cusp of it and it but they have to still deliver when especially in this campaign now like. The, but hook away crook, they'll, they should win against Georgia. But you would like to think that they can turn it on a little bit and give them even a bit more of that boost going into next year. When that's when like, there'll be a lot more pressure in terms of the the uh, the business end of the of the campaign. And you mentioned like say Sweden, like you would wonder, like they've already shown it against Finland about a very impressive home record too. Like that they are capable of going yeah. away from home and and putting it up. It could be in those games where the onus is on them to have that bit of patience and creativity and nous to get the games where that's where like. Like the, the style actually suits thing. them. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, it's just uh, okay. We keep talking about it, but it's such a shame that they're not going to be at the Euros next year. Right, let's. Uh, it's eight fifty six this morning. Some of the comments that have been coming in. Uh, Roy Keane spot on again. Re Kenny, he had two and a bit campaigns and won four games in total. Kenny talks a good game though, and as Keane said, has the Dublin media on his side. Says Connor. Um, who's, who's the Dublin media? Who's he on about there? Uh, this was Keane <laughs> the other day. No, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, it's you, obviously. I know, yeah. Uh, Jack says the Ragnik not playing Ronaldo argument is silly. Ragnik had 35 year old Raul, played him and fitted workers around him. Uh, Pakalu says, Good evening from Malaysia. I come here to listen to your discussions about Manchester United. Great stuff always. Oh, thanks very much, and you're very welcome. Uh, United had a runner in Daniel James, says Colum, and sold him to Leeds, where he runs all day long for Bielsa, but didn't get the chances at Man United because he's not a big enough name. Name recognition. That's interesting, sorry, on that, because like, Daniel James started the season ahead of Sancho. With United and then they get rid of him. So this this comes back into it a little bit where you're like, well, why why play him at the start of the season? If you knew that you he wasn't really for you and and was it was dispensable, why kind of play him at the start at the start of the year ahead of a player who you've spent seventy million on and had chased for two years? Um, the excuse would be obviously there was the Euros and Sancho trained late, blah blah blah. I don't think Sancho even keep the ball at the Euros, did he? I mean, come off played one game, I think, or come yeah. off the bench for um but obviously Gareth Southgate didn't like what he saw. Mm. And uh and I don't know, maybe maybe he's gonna have a great career and he's still very young, but um, Sancho Sancho or James? Uh, Sancho. Sancho. Like, oh, yeah, like he see, clearly has like something. James was pretty cheap. They could have loaned him out for a season and kept him if they thought that there was something there. I don't know. It just it again it doesn't feel like mm. here's a prototype player, here's our depth for those. It's like Oh, we can have Pogba and we can have Ronaldo and we can have Varane. They'll all fit in a team, won't they? Go off and you make it work, Ollie. Come on. He's like, yeah, of course I will. No problems. But I think with James as well, I think like demands were placed on him last year and specifically to improve. I remember like li- li- reading stuff and, and listening about that, and like it's clear that maybe he wasn't hitting the I suppose would you call them KPIs or the targets that had been had been set for him. Like he had a couple of impressive games. Like I'm trying to think of like, the lead, a couple of games against Leeds. I think it was a game against Chelsea or Man City as well, where mm-hmm. he was one of those players who tactically, if you gave him a job to do in a row, he would do it. He would, he would do it. Yeah. And you, you do need those players, and you do need those players in the squad. But clearly, when it came to it, they just felt, well, do you know what? We can get rid of you, but that's what made it all the more baffling that you started the season. And look, maybe maybe they thought that the money was too much to turn down, yeah. and so um, it was some trimming of the squad that needed to, to happen. Uh, Philip says it's all a smoke screen to get Carrick in. This is the long term plan, obviously, of uh, the jobs for the boys. Fletcher's like, come on, we get this guy in, we'll all learn from him for a while, and you'll be back in. I don't think that's the plan. I don't think. Um, but do you, do you wonder if because obviously Carrick is going to be? It does seem as if Carrick is going to be staying on the on the coaching staff. Like, if Ranić says, if Ranić says this fella actually has something, and maybe hadn't been there, like what what happens then? 
will that happen? Like, or will like will Ranyak be coming in? Like, this is the thing. We don't know what's going to happen over no. the next little while. Like, if Ran- if, if Ranyak comes out and says Michael Carrick and Kieran McKenna are two of the most progressive, amazing coaches I've ever seen, well, then what uh, happens then? Uh, look, that I mean, do you know what I mean? I don't, don't think that's going to happen. But if it does happen, right? Like, then you yeah, have to listen to him, don't you? Exactly. Um, but do you are they progressive and experienced enough to take over full time in charge, or are they like? They could be the managers in five years' time or in ten years' time. Or if it would be great for them to go off and get some experience of top level Champions League management. Like wouldn't that be the thing to do? Yeah, but when we go instinct on it obviously is the fact that they've been around for so long now under say Mourinho as well and so they're not that progressive. And yeah, exactly. And you see what the, the same problems that have happened. And Solskjaer obviously put a lot of faith in these people as well. It wasn't yeah. as if Solskjaer was the one saying, This is exactly how it has to go. Like he did actually delegate quite a lot especially on the car, on, on the training pitch to allow and he's, some of the problems that United had in terms of being able to break teams down that was clearly coming down to what was happening on the on the training pitch in terms of working out ways of playing so um, whether, or, whether or not he feels you know what because he's only coming in for six months that we need to keep a coaching staff who are there and then if something needs to change after that because it's going to be a new manager that's probably like what will happen like it could be because Rania came in on for for these six months because he also got this two years con- consultancy, it could be a bit different to get high caliber coaches out of a job to work with them for six months and not have that same guarantee at the end of it. Yeah, and, and look, maybe the consultancy is just a guarantee of money that will pay you to yeah, true, give right. us access to your scouting network or something. You know, it's hard to know exactly how important a role he's going to have. Like if you're Ten Hag or you're Pochettino, do you really want Rania? Over your shoulder every day, training in a, in a tracksuit on the ground. No, get out. I don't want you. That's it. And maybe the, you look at it now. And it does seem as if there's an awful lot of like an awful lot of chiefs. Oh, kind of not. Was it was that phrase again? Too many chiefs on the field. Was it? That That's it. Yeah. So like, because um, like, there's a lot of people there, and you're kind of thinking, like, even like say for like Darren Fletcher's role. Like Darren Fletcher's role seems to be kind of like a hybrid coach, technical director type thing you saw him on the bench obviously for in the, the yeah. Villarreal away game I, I, yeah. and obviously then there's John Morton who's a football director Ed Woodward apparently is going to be staying on as a as a consultant because obviously well, there's a lot of money involved y- there you know um, so like and then there's obviously like, there's, there's still other people there who are like Matt George is still there he's like isn't he like the chief negotiator for the club as well like, there seems to be like an awful lot of people and other clubs seem to have a similar kind of amount of people but have a much more clear defined structure on, on what their roles are and also seem to be a bit better at their jobs behind the scenes because I don't think one person like say Ranyu coming in is going to cure all United's ills it does seem to be this very Fergus and complex where they feel as if oh, we just need one dominant figure who can be there and can just yeah. run everything and then just the nature of how football is now I think it's just very difficult to have them, those demands on one man you know yeah there's no Messiah, it turns out. Yeah. There is no Messiah. Two minutes past nine this morning here on OTBAM. It is officially the 30th of November, which means it's the last day of the month, which means it's time for the finale of our Movember rankings. Uh, OTBAM with Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, let's mow. Joseph Conroy is with us, who wasn't actually in, technically in the competition, but who we have to say would have won this competition had he entered. Joseph, good morning to you. Morning, Jerry, how's it going? If I had entered and only had the 30 days, I probably wouldn't have won, so might be lying there, but I'll take it. Um, this is my first time doing this with you, Joseph. I've been reduced to commenting live on the YouTube stream every week when you've been doing it, and my language has been unparliamentary, to say the least, because you've basically stitched me up from the get-go. Which of the burner accounts have you been on those Fridays? Or on my own, on, on my own with my own name. That's how, that's okay. how pissed off I was. They must have been moderated then. They mustn't have gotten through the filter. I feel like I should, should just step away from this conversation. The, the bad language filter obviously uh, kept in. Yeah, you didn't. You obviously hate charity. That's that's what we. Anybody who <laughs> hasn't grown the mo obviously hates charity. That's that's what happens this month of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, for for our ritual humiliation, I've gone Maxime Medar today. That's my um, that's my uh, spirit animal. Okay, well, we'll get into that in a second. Um, so as we'll kick off here, what an occasion. Um, it's a bit like the cup final on Sunday, just, you know, great to be involved, great to see everyone turn out. It's been so much discussion all week. I know people are kind of keen to see how the final rankings are landing. We've got our first update of the morning is the rankings did change overnight when the final submissions came in. So I suppose we'll just get into it. In place number three, bottom of the table here is Alan Sheehan. <laughs> the early front runner, <laughs> lost a bit of momentum, this, we've kind of said before, this is the Mo next door. 
it's very good, great shape, nice tones in it, good definition. Um, came out strong. There wasn't kind of that development. We didn't get that kind of story. We didn't get, we did, it didn't really, it kind of arrived in a, in a way that it didn't take us anywhere else. Oh, and also kind of reacted to previous rankings. We went first to second by questioning whether the ranking was being ironic. I sort of, he seemed quite confused by the whole thing. So I don't know, we'll check in on tomorrow and see how he feels about the final position. But this is no way a uh, knock on own and his entry. It's more a reflection of the quality of the of uh, the task we've had this year. So <laughs> fair play to Alan, he's coming in third. third. Third of three. Well done, Owen. Congratulations. Third of three. You're very proud. But it's good, though. The, the bronze medalist. This brings us on to our silver medalist. And it is going to be Jared Gilroy. Up one place in the power rankings. This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three things to say about this. Number one, we've had the ongoing conversation. We've seen a lot of the conversation online about your, your state of cheating. We know that Paul Bill Belichick, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. I think like the bit of that quote people forget is, but just don't tell everyone about it. So <laughs> for the integrity of the competition, we've put you in number two. Um, kind of the parameters that we were given on this were definition, creativity, impact. Definition has improved a lot. You've really showed up for the last week. Creativity speaks for itself. Impact. On overall impact, I feel a bit like we're looking at an impressive task. We're also working, looking at a bit of a work in progress. It feels like you're building to this bigger vision, which hasn't been fully realized. So you've come in second. I will say, though, it's a great effort. I'll also say in the long term, this could be like one of those sort of great Dutch teams from the 70s where maybe the legacy of the Mo will kind of transcend the competition and be remembered for changing the game. But Total for this gosh. morning, it's come in second. Okay, I accept that. Uh, you've, you've, won, follow- you've won me back. There's one follow-up question. It's now, we've been sold that you're going to do the daddy. Can you talk us a bit through the strategy? I think we have some daddy pictures where he's kind of grown the extremity of the tash and curled it up. You seem to have taken more of a kind of mutton chop approach where you're physically <laughs> growing the shape onto your face. There's been some confusion about that. Do you want to just clarify what the strategy was and give your overall reaction to the second place? It's called needs must uh, in that I couldn't actually, this is this is a month's growth in the in the corners. That's that's how, that's my shitty little effort. Couldn't get any little brill cream for it just to kind of give Maybe it Maybe it turns out you probably need to, like yeah. I, I didn't realise that you like you need all the products. You need to be feeding it the, the vitamins and the, uh, what's the what's that thing that Rob Gronkowski advertises the hair loss thing you can do that in your face so I, that's what I need I just I, I don't think I, I'm never going to play football for Ireland and I'm probably also never going to have a dally moustache I've just made the same realisation at, at the same moment that these two things are never going to be real for me and are you following through on the growing until Christmas plan ah yeah sure why not like what else are we going to do it mm. looks like there could exactly. be a lockdown coming like what, well, what are we all going to do I don't know, grow big, mutton job mustaches. But the, uh, the Maxine Medar us. thing, that was like a, there's, I can salvage this somehow. That was really, but there's too much, there's too much grey. You can't see it. It kind of, it blends into the distance. I'd say though, another four mm. weeks till Christmas, that's going to change as well. So I'd say, I'd say stick at it. Medar is a great reference point. Maybe a bit, I, I see where as soon as you said that it kind of clicked a bit more but uh, yeah great effort oh, if and I told you in advance it was Maxime Medard and I would have been first is what you're saying that's not what we're saying I mean you're doing well to be second given all the conversation <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be a big reaction to this the state of cheating the it's the Canelo Alvarez Tash it's the impressive but tainted legacy and one that we're still still captivating still generating debate dividing opinion inspiring all of the above uh this all brings us on to the leader of the pack, the man who's walked away with the prize, Adrian Barry, our very own Tiger King. Um, we said to him early on, we wanted a bit more flair, a bit more definition. He's taken all the notes, he's delivered, he's coming with, he's scoring big on impact. Um, kind of got sort of Sunday, you're in the middle of nowhere, you come across a random gang of lads on bikes, stopping off at St. Patrick's Station as you, there's Adrian get himself some monkey dories and a copy to go along on his way. So, fair play to Adrian. Um, and his yeah, it really chaps. just speaks for itself. All right. That is impressive, in fairness. Yeah, it's not bad. I'm, 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 Yours is kind of going good way. You're going... Yeah, I'm yeah. going up, he's going down. Uh, yeah, okay. So, Adrian's the winner. What if, what's, what's his prize? He just goes down in the annals. He just has that badge of honour. It will be interesting to see the legacy of this, whether 
your own tash kind of kicks on the next few weeks and will be the one that will kind of have the legacy. It's like, you know, who really knows who won the 1974 World Cup. It's kind of been a bit lost over time. No one really remembers. So you know, but, uh, for Adrian, it's impressive. And by not he, showing up, it's even more. And it's, but it's easy to do it now when the pressure's off. The pressure was on for the month and you weren't able to live on. <laughs> Yeah, but it's a lifetime thing. It's a, a this is not just for Christmas. This is uh, it's like a puppy. Uh, Joseph, good stuff. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Um, yeah, that's it. Really fair play. Looking forward to next year. Maybe we'll get a few more people involved. Maybe Dave will get involved. Maybe I'll get involved properly. Um, we'll see. But fair play. Tash looks great, and looking forward to seeing where it goes. You uh, you um, took to the role of uh, judging like a duck to water there, Joseph. It really suited you. So congratulations, well done. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Joseph Conroy, the uh, grand pooba of uh, moustaches on OTBAM, giving us the official final rankings for November, which obviously finishes today. And it, I, look, it's obviously a facetious enough point, but actually the charities associated with November are doing great stuff on uh, men's physical health and men's mental health. And if you want to get involved, check out their website. Our uh, little enterprise has been, of course, in association with Gillette. Proud sponsors of Movember, gentlemen, let's mow. We're going to take a quick break. Here's what's coming up on OTV Sports Radio for the rest of the day. And we're going to be back um, talking about the uh, FA Cup win at the weekend with Stephen O'Donnell. Uh, Ronnie Delaney's OTV Gold at one o'clock. Dadcast from three. Our career retrospective is Stephen Elliott at four. And Jerry Eisenberg has got a new book out about Muhammad Ali talking about his life covering Muhammad Ali at 6 it's a sensational interview with him 7 o'clock tonight Ireland versus Georgia with Nathan Murphy and Emma Byrne uh, we'll bring you some uh, is it Katie McCabe or is it um, I think it is Katie McCabe an interview that we've done with her about her time at Arsenal as part of our Cadbury series and then there's loads more as well between 7 and 10 with Joe this evening up next though Pat's boss Stephen O'Donnell OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Oh, we'll all enjoy this. Munster legends Alan Quinlan and Neil Briggs are joining forces to bring you all the latest analysis, news, interviews, and so much more. Keno Mahoney is literally an opposition scrum half's nightmare. People say I refereed lots of matches when I actually played. <laughs> I, 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 do, I double jobbed. The Red 78 with Alan Quinlan and Neil Briggs. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. I th- I'm not too sure how the Giants move forward without cleaning house. Um, and that's not trying to be dramatic in any way, shape or form. They let Tom Cochran go, I think it was in 2016, and they brought in Ben McAdoo as the head coach. He got two years, he was gone. They brought in Pat Shermer, he got two years, he was gone. They brought in Joe Judge, he got two years. If it gets any worse, he'll probably be gone too. So we're getting two years, two years, two years. And we're not really getting any kind of identity with with any of these teams. Um, but the head coaches aren't necessarily the only issue. It, it's, it goes probably levels above that. The level above that is Dave Gettleman, the, the general manager who took over in 2018. So this is his fourth season in charge. And Dave Gettleman's manifesto from the outset was run the ball, get after the quarterback, get in hog mollies. And if you're unfamiliar with Dave Gettleman's, um, I suppose, range of vocabulary, what he means by hog mollies is big offensive linemen, which is fine. I understand you win the game in the trenches and have a good quarterback. So that was his kind of four-point plan. The Giants' offensive line has ranked among the five worst in the league for four years consistently now. They have been in the bottom five in terms of defensive pressure getting after the quarterback five years in a row. They've been in the bottom 10 run games four years in a row. And they've had the worst offense in the league broadly over the course of those four or five years as well. So he has conclusively failed in every piece of his manifesto from the get-go. It it is remarkable to to witness. I remember in 2019 when they picked Daniel Jones in the draft. If you ever get five minutes free in your day, look up a compilation video of fan reactions to the Daniel Jones pick in the 2019 NFL draft, and it will warm your heart because it is truly hilarious. The Daniel Jones pick, if you believe that your quarterback is going to be the be-all, end-all, and he's going to change your franchise, by all means, trade up and take him number one. Just look at what the Cardinals did by dropping Josh Rosen and Garner for Kyler Murray, and, and that's paying dividends there. That was a good idea, and it worked out. Daniel Jones at number six was completely unforgivable. Um, made only worse by taking Barkley, who I love, by the way. I think Saquon Barkley is immensely talented, but at number two in the NFL draft. And if you've looked at how teams, or I suppose successful teams, have built over the years, you don't pick a running back with the number two pick in a draft. You, you just don't do it. You get a good quarterback, you get a good defensive line, and you go from there. But the person picking Gettleman and making all these decisions is John Mara. And 
you know what John Mara did with his off season, uh, Ronan? I don't. You'll have to enlighten me here. John Mara campaigned to invoke the taunting rule in the NFL this summer. That's how he spent his off season. That was his main piece of work that he did. Oh, that so was... not only has he made the Giants consistently worse over the last five or ten years, he's also made the league worse with this ridiculous rule. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online, then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. Right, you're very welcome back. Now, in the ad break there, you would have heard a clip from The Snap on OTB. It's brought to you in association with the Erlingus College Football Classic. Check out details for Northwestern Wildcats versus Nebraska Huskers at the Aviva on Saturday, the 27th of August, 2022, on collegefootballireland.com. That was Matt Carolyn on the New York Giants challenge to get the team back on track. And uh, it is, uh, well, they won at the weekend, so maybe it's working. Uh, right, um, David Snay's with us in studio. We're going to talk about the FA Cup final. We'll be joined by Stephen O'Donnell in a few minutes' time. Talk to us about the Keith Buckley, Chris Forrester piece that you had in the 42 at the weekend. Um, it was about 10,000 words, was it? Um, 6,100. Right, 6,100. So 30, just over 30,000 fewer than we were actually at the match. Which right, was nice. very good. Um, it was a great piece. If anybody hasn't read this, you um, these two were mates from underage and obviously playing on opposite sides in the Cup final. But you, you brought them through the North Inner City and the South Inner City which is kind of where they grew up and where they learned how to play ball and um, I thought it spoke a lot about the, the, the they talk about themselves being townies or not in Forrester's yeah, case Yeah, Forrester talk because he's a bit four route near Smith you know? yeah, yeah, he's posh <laughs> uh, and so uh, like that kind of slightly underrepresented aspect of the league it, it, it it's a very important part of the his, history of the League of Ireland Absolutely, yeah No, I just thought as well the fact that Obviously, it was Pats and Balls. It was in the Aviva. It's like I wanted to try and make a, a bit of a celebration of Dublin a little bit and kind of capture what it was like to be from Dublin. And then, obviously, it just made... When you realise the two lads who were playing in centre midfield against each other, grew up... Well, I say grew up, they were kind of playing from under, under 16, 17 at Belvedere together. Started at Balls together, Keith and, and Chris. And... Yeah, I just kind of luckily it took a couple of weeks to to arrange. The clubs were obviously great to deal with in terms of doing it. It was just trying to trying to fit it in because like yeah, like Keith, Keith, Keith was working the week of the cup final, like right up till Friday. He had Friday off, works as a, as a painter and decorator, doing his usual training. So he kind of had that Sunday free to do it. So made sure to fit it in. And yeah, I just I was just, I was just really really lucky that I, like I'll be honest, like it's it's weird kind of talking about an article you you kind of wrote because as soon as it's done you kind of almost forget about it. not forget about it but you you don't want to do too much but genuinely was absolutely blown away by what people were talking about on on say social media and with the people of forty two just how happy they are with it it was just because I kind of exceeded my expectations in the sen- in the sense of of how it worked out and the people that we bumped into and the two lads are just. So two lads are just brilliant. Like they were great crack from the moment I met them. For it, like I think it hel- I think a little bit helps the fact that obviously they would know me from covering the league over the last little while. So they they knew where I was coming from in terms of what I wanted to do with the article and stuff. And uh, thankfully it didn't rain and it worked well. And so just explain what you did. You, you like literally travelled. Yeah, so I just met the two lads. So obviously, so Chris Chris Forrester um, is is from uh, Paul Street, just off Smithfield Square on the in this uh, North Inner City. And Keith is from Countess Markovich House, just um, on Townsend Street near Pier Street. And met the two met the two of them at, at the Hypeny Bridge. And I just said, right, well, look, I said to them beforehand, obviously, arranged, but just think of places where it would be important to you that you would like to go to. And we just have a little bit of a chat and places that from where you, when you would have grown up or even now that you kind of, that's where you feel most comfortable, you know. And uh, that's what we did. So we just bumped on, bumped on the Lewis at, at, at Jervis. Even before that, bumping into Uncle Michael, <laughs> Uncle Mick, who uh, was Keith's, uh, Keith's uncle, Keith's dad's brother. And... This was this this is what I think made the article in terms of why why people have kind of resonate why it resonated with a lot of people was just the fact that the, the the two lads were so open in what they were talking about and how they were how they were speaking but then also the people along the way and none of it was actually staged like I, even even before I turned up the only place that I knew for definite I was going to was obviously uh, the Hapney Bridge other than that it was like you just take me where you want to go right. and whatever and 
just see how the conversation went. I kind of had an idea of little themes I wanted to go through in terms of the article, but it was just have to chat with them and see where it went. And then I kind of I kind of realised within about five minutes that I kind of struck gold with it, especially when one got involved and then seeing Chris's young daughter, Isabel, and then Keith's dad and then Evan, the referee, who kind of nearly got knocked, knocked down by two Lewises to get involved with the conversation, which is pretty funny. But, um, I know, it was just it was just the two lads and their families just made, and I'll be honest, it was genuinely the easiest thing I've ever had to, to write in terms of just transcribing it, because, like, the story was there from the day, like, it didn't have to, you just let, let it flow and let and let them go, because, like, they were, so, they were so good and they were so open, and even chatting how they were talking to each other and stuff. It was just brilliant and it was just a bit of a privilege to be there with, with them as well, especially to kind of add to the coverage for the cup final because there was so much so much great stuff written from lads about it too. And, and obviously Stephen O'Donnell's going to be on. He did a great interview with Padge, like his closest mate from himself with Dan and McDonald and the Indo and stuff. And see you Neil know, O'Reilly was writing good stuff. All the lads, like, like, wanted, like, there was just so much good coverage because, like, it's one of the benefits of, of the league in terms of when you, a lot of lads trust you so much. Like, you know, they know that they want it, you want it, you would you want to portray. It, things in a, in, a, in a good light but also get those stories across and get the sense of what it is to be in the league because I think sometimes maybe it's kind of underestimated just the value that it has Yeah and even the the um, different circumstances where one of them is a full time footballer and one of them is a painter decorator Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And This is uh, again it's the type of stuff that you would have known instinctively about a lot of GEA players that they have jobs because it gets talked about all the time yeah. you know, it, it's literally it gets talked about all the time about their their jobs but that is kind of it's less spoken about with regards to the League of Ireland and it feels to me a little bit like there's, the league is in a crossover phase where it's it's crossing over from um, being niche to something that's far more mainstream even though it was always kind of it was the steady drumbeat of matches and fixtures and scores was always there but you can only do that if the personality of the people involved becomes something that resonates with the wider public I don't know what it's like for you in the middle of that yeah like no it, I, you do you kind of like say for again I don't want to come, be coming across kind of maybe a self important about it but I kind of realised after the interview I was like that I did have something good with it and I was like I wanted to try and get this across really well cause, and make sure that people who are really that's why I kind of said I remember when I tweeted out just saying like welcome to Dublin because it just felt as if like this was the best side of what Dublin in our city Dublin and the, and the people who are there and the, and the footballers who are there and even like again like it's I'm talking about myself here but even with the fact that like my dad would be from Broadstone and like even like he was delighted with it and I think that made that kind of meant even the two lads and their families were and all like the lads who come back to me about it I was I was just happy that they liked it and even getting that little thing from like my old dad who'd be from around that if not too far from where from where Chris is from that like even his mates then who he because he played for Sheriff like and then his mates who wouldn't necessarily always be reading what he'd be writing or whatever were getting in touch saying bang on the money like and I kind of like that's I want because I want to try and get that authenticity about it across which I'm I think I hope we managed to deal with the lads and because they are like, that's what I'm saying like there was nothing it's not bullshit with them like they were just honest and pure up and it was great like yeah in a way that's what the league needs it needs that but that's what it is that's the thing this, this is what the league is about like I remember a while ago and even someone who I, I, I absolutely hated it the the tagline real football real fans because I think if you're trying to if you're trying to entice people in and get people excited about it you're going to piss off people the whole bar still their thing like someone like myself who would have like I love League of Ireland I've been going to League of Ireland since I was a kid but then I'd also have a, a real love for for English football as well and just, I don't think you, there's anything wrong with that so like but I think how you might get people involved other than the fact that there's some really good footballers in the league and the football is being played and obviously Stephen O'Donnell is one of them in terms of players who have come back and like, a progressive coach who kind of gets playing and is able to revitalise the club like that's all happening on the pitch. Like when people are there, it's because of what's around it as well that you kind of do need to do a bit more with and trying to sell and get the whole sense of that belonging and, and a feeling to it. But getting people, feel, but making those people who do come into it, making them believe, not they can belong to it straight away. It's not as if you're. Oh, there's no uh, barrier to entry. There isn't. There really isn't. And I think there's a myth about that that annoys me a little bit as well. That people think that if they rock up to the Camac on Richmond Park or if you go to Daly Mill Park that they they be looked at saying what are you doing here. Like I've never seen that happen. Clubs need fans. Clubs need fans. Really people, I think people and fans who were there realise that as well. That every every kind of um, body through the turnstile 
is going to lead to a more stable club and a more stable kind of sustainable kind of model for football in the country like you know uh, what I mean? uh, so again to, to what's your so Stephen isn't going to join us this morning by the way he's, he's cancelled at the last minute and we'll, we'll hopefully get him on in the next day or two but um, what, what's your view on, on so put the cup final in context for us right We've seen um, Irish crowds come out for one-off occasions in the past um, in different sports and it's it's used sometimes as a barometer. Everything's great because we're, we're able to hit these record crowds. But actually the truth is it's, it's a one-off thing and everything gets funneled that way. Hmm. It seems that over the last three or four seasons and over the last... Well, maybe, maybe since Dundalk made a breakthrough that actually, uh, although that hasn't wasn't particularly sustainable but the, the the game itself at a domestic level is getting organized there are more good quality people involved in the administration of the clubs than there ever have been that they realize that it needs to be sustainable and that it can't just be yeah a massive injection of cash that you give to the players and then those players leave and there's gone, nothing yeah. but that's it like it can't be like that i can't do the whole boom and bust and I, but i do think as well like it was great obviously toward 27,000 people who were at the aviva at the weekend for the final part of the reason would be is that, that it's two clubs who are trying to connect properly and put proper resources into what they do around their communities and that can't be scoffed at because that's what they're the values that are needed like the culture that needs how you have to build it for a while is the fact that going to watch a match on a Friday night is part of your life you know what I mean like you might have a good season like the dog have a good season for well they've quite a quite few, good few seasons and you'll naturally get people who want to be attracted to that success but when it does fade away which is the, night, the nature of football well who's going to be left and what is it if they're only there because of the success well they'll be the first ones to go and if 60, 50, 60, 70 percent are only there because they kind of get to see a team that's winning or whatever well then then you're in trouble it's like well, well how do you create that bond and that feeling and, and an affinity and it, it's from a, such a young age that's why everything the perfect storm that's come with Brexit and all the rest of it one thing that struck me at the weekend was the amount of young people who were there obviously with their families because of obviously how tickets were done was, was spot on too as well but I think the fact now that League of Ireland clubs have to put significant resources in to academy football and for youngsters with football that that's such an important thing like if for so long like when I was growing up be clubs like wouldn't really have had even a schoolboy team, like you know what I mean. And there you wouldn't. No reason for kids to identify with like, the local. Yeah, like, the only, like the only reason why I, I, I would have went to watch, say, St. Pat's growing up was because I was brought there by by family. I lived in Luke, and it was the closest team, Timmy. But like, I could have easily if that never happened, I never would have went really. Other than maybe as you get a bit older, you and you meet friends and you go with friends, and yeah. that's the natural progression. But that's what has to happen with football, like in terms of with the League of Ireland when you see it's it's great but it has to be bottom up you can't, it's not going to just be top down where you have 37,000 at the cup final but you need to have a sustainable in terms of having people coming through because they actually feel that connection with a club and, and see that clubs are, are doing that constant are constantly out there in their communities with the different kind of projects that they would do but also now and it's going to be the biggest thing which is so obvious is because they're gonna, there's going to be so many kids now coming through playing for every League of Ireland club through academies from the age of 13 up and even younger with their like it's only going to be so natural now that they're going to feel that bond to a, to a club and the families are so used to it and that if they're there training during the week and then they have the game like that Friday nights and going to games is part of their culture of the club and it's hopefully I don't think it'll hopefully think we see a huge boost in it in the next few years but even if it is over the next 10 years where you, you steadily see it that's what what you would naturally need to happen now. So we have to stick with the plan that has been instigated, even though Rude Doctor is leaving. That, He's leaving, yeah. That. Well, well, yeah, because there's a huge opportunity there. And I think if you, you see what's happening with, say, with, with Brexit, and like that's not going to change. Like, there's, there's not going to be. No, they ain't going back. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it, that's it. And you have to. And like, obviously, so Irish football is playing catch up majorly. The thing, the the issue that I would have, and think that could maybe be a big big worry is that say there's lads all coming through the system of the academy system you, you don't want to just have it as like a mini system of what happens in the UK where there's so many stories of heartbreak of kids who don't make it and then they feel totally disillusioned with, with the club there has to be a link where the club and, and playing football yeah for some of them they know that from maybe 15, 16 that there's a serious chance there for them to progress and have a career but those others still feel part that they actually belong to the club and while they don't might not make it as players which most of them won't that they're not just discarded and that they don't just because like even writing say articles so many times of lads who've gone away to England and in the League of Ireland at first level is a place where they rebuild their lives they rebuild their careers as, as footballers but now you're going to have that point where there'll be lads coming through 
and they're going to be having that feeling already here. So yeah. they haven't got those League of Ireland clubs to turn to or haven't got that feeling. Well, you'd hope that the Irish clubs will have a, a more rounded approach towards education and think that, like, you, you can't, you know, it's it's probably easier for an English club to look at um, their multinational makeup kids and think, well, I'm never going to see you again. Or at least in Ireland, it's like... And that's happening. Like the Maz and Daz will be knocking around to the coaches going, you know, yeah. what, what is he going to do after this? Well, that's yes. Well, and, and this is the thing, like, clubs have had it at, for, with tour level institutions for so long. Like, so many clubs have links. Like, say, Jamie McGrath, who would have come through and had a scholarship at Minute and, and got his degree through Minute and then played for, obviously, Pat Dundalk and now for Ireland. But what's happening now in Rovers, I think, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Rovers were the first where their academy lads had, where some of their academy lads were getting um, education at secondary level private, pri- in private school in South Dublin. So they were able to train full time. And I suppose the most high profile uh, proponent of that is Gavin Bazzunio. Yeah. Like he was, a- he was able to stay here a bit longer. And I think he, he would have done his leaving cert here other than I think Man City realised how good he was. Like, now we actually want you a bit, a bit sooner because right. the, the original plan was for him to stay with Rovers, play a bit longer because he think he had signed the kind of pre-contract where it, where it was, do his leaving cert here and then go over. But then because they realised what they had in their hands, were like, no, we'll, we'll get you over now. So with Rovers, I know Hats are in the process. I think of doing something similar. Other clubs, you can be sure, are doing it as well. Yeah. And that's like you, like UCD have just been promoted. Like the amount of players that UCD have produced for the league behind the whole thing of the scholarships and being able to have that education like there is the education I think has to be linked at the forefront with young lads coming through now because first of all even if they do make it as professional footballers that's not going to set them up for the rest of their life No. so how are you going to entice people to stay here who have to stay here to continue their football education when you're still putting those building blocks in place it's by making sure especially with families and you know as a parent as well if you or know your kid's going to get looked after with an education that, a good education at secondary level and then has the process to play football and go to go to college and have something behind them like it just seems like the most obvious way forward but then you're changing years and years of thinking of how you do become a footballer yeah big opportunity to do that though given everything that's happened oh massive you know especially when there isn't going to be a, a pipeline there for our best young players to go to England as early as they did and sorry as well with education why I think it's even more important would be like because there's so much like, clubs have to do so much now to actually get their facilities up to scratch for, for training while they're playing football but also having full time coaches so like what can you offer kids then that's ready to go and there and it's an education infrastructure Yeah. so if that's the thing that you can always use as a bit of time to buy time to actually get your house in order on the football side of things but that's how you do it and that's what's going to be giving parents a much more of a reason to want their kids to stay which they obviously have to I suppose until they're 18 but also it gives kids a bit of a focus as well knowing that they're not just training a few times a week and they have to stay here and they're falling so far behind they also have something there that's backing them up yeah okay um, uh, a lot of people speculating about where Stephen O'Donnell is going to end up next year um, uh, and who is going to end up with the Dundalk job different stories in the papers over the last couple of days Steve Staunton was linked with the pa- with the job yesterday um, uh, Stephen O'Donnell was linked with the Dundalk job what do you think is going to happen? Um, well, this is interesting because obviously it would have been great to talk to him about this. Like even before he was coming on, obviously it was put to me by someone very close to the club that he's going to be staying on as manager, right? And that he's going to be there for at least another couple of years now, and it's something that has to get fleshed out over the next couple of days. It's so that very difficult to turn your back on something when you've just started a period of success and and when you've had an immediate impact. Like you know, Chris Forrester was saying we were the only ones who put it up to Rovers in your piece the weekend. Yeah. It, like it's true, right? Well, yeah, it it is, and it is it it is because they were second. They still finished like fifteen points, they were fifteen sixteen points behind. But it got to that stage in the season when Rovers did win at Richmond Park and scored a late goal. That's when they pulled away, and that was relatively late. So the gap is a bit misleading. I, yeah. do, I do think Rovers. I do think obviously were were the best team in the country. But yeah, no, Pats are like it was, and it was so it was very. It was very telling after the game uh, on Sunday the fact that Ian Birmingham came in, Lee Desmond came in, Dara Bourne's three players came in, and Dara Bourne's was the youngest, is the only one who's under contract. And both Lee and Ian Birmingham just were talking about how basically Stephen O'Donnell had totally revitalised the club and had brought it in a direction that they didn't think was possible after what had happened for a couple of years before that, where they kind of they'd lost its way and he kind of got a bit of grip and. Like he, he was big enough about the fact that Robbie Benson was a major f- factor in that come, getting him from Dundalk when he could have stayed there they'd been obviously winning stuff he was willing to come and believed in O'Donnell and he I think before the week of the match the week, a couple of weeks of the match 
when he had decided to play this kind of box form, box midfield formation of like Alfie Lewis and Jamie Lennon in front of the back four with Chris Forrester and um, Robbie Benson kind of above that with kind of both of them kind of acting as a false nine he kind of said do you trust me do you believe that this do you trust me that this is going to work or whatever and they're all like yeah 100% like they're all behind because they, they've seen the work that's gone in and anyone who's been at Richmond Park over the last while the transformation in the mentality around the place and just how they're playing is just been it's been staggering and there'll be European football there like it's a it's a big thing to turn your back on yeah and to go to a situation in, D- in Dundalk where like certainly the stories that we've been hearing not quite convinced that the budget's going to be there that everybody thinks it's going to be there mm. that expectations are going to be slightly out of kilter it's a team or it's a, a group of fans and supporters who assume that success is going to get back to the level that it was at in the glory days but like they're they need to rebuild and there's been a lot of expense you know it'd be just interesting to see exactly what happens there like sometimes building something that's yours is better than going to somewhere which on the face of it is supposed to be bigger but isn't yeah and and, and no it's very it's a very good point and i think also the fact that where the relative where they are relative at the moment and how far they are along like i think like Dundalk is going to be a serious job on their hands. They've lost quite a significant number of players and important players who have made such a big difference. Like obviously Michael Duffy, Patrick McLenny going to Derry. Like there's going to be that Derry challenge coming next year, which is going to be quite very, very, very interesting. But like Pat's, like O'Donnell, like if he does, if that is sorted out now in the next few days, and he's going to be staying on, like he's he's not going to have much of a break in terms of over Christmas. He's going to have a few players there that he does need to get signed up. But the, but the the fact is, I don't think he's going to have much convincing to do either. That's it, you know. So yeah. like they kind of see where where they're at, and like even f- for him, for Stephen, like he kind of is at a stage as well where like he's still relatively. It is it's like still a, uh, not a novice, but it's a burgeoning, a burgeoning co- coaching career. You know, you know what I mean? Like, he, I don't think he needs to jump at another rebuilding job straight away when he's in the process of actually maybe yeah. very close to taking the next step up pats. Yeah, no, for sure. And it'd be great to see him how he would do in European football next year with that and just yeah. to see what level of progress they can do and how, how much of a, a title charge they can make next season. David, good stuff. Thanks for joining us today. Cheers. What a pleasure. Check out David's piece on the 42 from the weekend as well. Um, even in retrospect, it's a great piece as well. A reminder, OTBM with Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, let's mow. We want to give a special shout out to Sean O'Hara who's been on the show a couple of times over the course of the last month, who's doing the final of his 30 marathons in 30 days for November. He aimed to raise 25 grand. His running total is 25,395. And as you know, there's a um, good for 15 hours left in the day. So uh, congratulations to Sean. It's an incredible achievement and well done. Tomorrow, we're reacting to Ireland against Georgia. Tonight, we'll also hear from Samuel Lockhurst of the Manchester Evening News. And we might even talk to Jonathan Wilson about the style of play that you can expect from Ralph Ranick. Uh, right now, Fiona Hayes and Darren Cave on Monday Night Rugby. Enjoy. Okay, from Monday Night Rugby, we're joined by Fiona Hayes. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Joe. How are you getting on? Very well. And also a guest who says he will only join us whenever Ulster win at the RDS. So (laughs) here he is, Darren. Hello. Joe, I actually need to clarify that I agreed to come on here on Thursday. uh, And that was when we all thought that Ulster were going to ship 50 points. So uh, it's good that you actually brought that up early. (laughs) Cave thought he was coming on for a good hatchet job on Ulster. And now here he is having to be positive about things. I'm, uh, I'm literally just scrambling up my page of excuses um, and uh, all I can see written down now in my notes is fluke. <laughs> the uh, pandemic hasn't given us much, but your moustache is one of the few positives, I think. Fiona's already commented on how much she liked it. Um, she said, how much money have you raised uh, from November? Uh, yes, for about eight, 18 or 20 months, Joe, and uh, it's a midlife crisis. Well, listen, there are worse things. So, uh, Fiona, I had thought that rugby discussions centering around COVID were behind us and yet here we are. So back with the bang, unfortunately, over the last couple of days. Suddenly the word Omicron. I've used it more in the last two days than in my entire life. So with the news today, Monday, is that the Munster squad has been cleared to travel home bar one member of the party who has COVID and then one close contact. So of the (laughs) 34 person party, 32 will travel home. The weekend that was, if you weren't following the various machinations of all this, uh, Munster and Scarlets travelled to Cape Town on the Saturday night with a view to getting on a charter flight with Cardiff and Zebre on the Sunday morning. There was a round of PCR testing though and one Munster positive came back and then two Cardiff positives came back. Certainly one of them was reported to be an Omicron variant. So Cardiff stayed on, Munster stayed on and at least Munster are 
getting home now. URC have cancelled uh, the Bulls and Lions games for Munster these two weekends cancelled. So, look, it is uh, by a distance not the most important aspect of the uh, pandemic or the Omicron development, but for the uh, competition, this is a disaster. Yeah, that's it. It's it is a disaster. I mean, they were all going out there. We were, were how long are we talking about how 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 are the South African teams going to play differently in South Africa? We were excited what they were going to bring when they landed at home, and I guess we're not going to see it for a little bit now. And I would imagine poor old Munster, everyone over there. I think the bags were even on the plane. There was images of just you know they were they were on their way home, and all of a sudden nobody knew what was happening. So yeah, there's there's a lot going on, but. But for rugby, and especially with the with with the South African side in the tournament, it's 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 a real kick in the guts at the minute. So it seems certainly, I mean, listening to the various politicians and things change all the time. For the next three weeks, give or take, whilst uh, more is uh, discovered about the Omicron variant, then there's going to be a real emphasis on borders being closed and limitations on travel into the new year. Who knows where it will be? Obviously, there's already Omicron cases here in Ireland so maybe things will be relaxed if it becomes the uh, predominant variant again this is language I didn't think would ever be coming out of my mouth 18 (laughs) months ago but this is the way we're all talking now I suppose in the short term Darren Munster even if they were to get back tomorrow Stephen Donnelly Minister for Health says quarantining regardless of status so they would have to do their 10 days in quarantine so even if they got back tomorrow and got straight into quarantine then they would be out on Friday the 10th and they would be due to play Wasps in Coventry on the 12th. Now, I suspect quarantine doesn't mean you can go out and train for two hours a day. So I would think their European match, the first one certainly on the 12th against Wasps is in major danger now. Yeah, um, and despite me, Joe, being a self-proclaimed expert of everything, if we focus on the rugby, like as you are doing now, like the, the implications are huge. Um, uh, like uh, those European fixtures, um, like yeah, it's hard to see how that's going to happen, um, and it, you feel like it's going to drag on a lot further, and it's a real shame because we had a bit of a shambles of a Champions Cup uh, last year with points being awarded willy nilly, and and what is probably the the best club competition in the world. It was a real shame, and there's no real time for those fixtures to be replayed add on the the implications of it feels like there might be a bit more of this to happen um i know this the scarlets actually i heard um through the grapevine they're actually in belfast they're actually isolating in belfast at the minute um they have to stay there for 10 days and so big question marks over european cup fixtures over christmas derbies um, so, you know, jokes aside, there are bigger implications for, for, for COVID-19, but from a rugby point of view, it's starting to become a real mess again, uh, and that's a shame. Yeah, so we'll see how it all develops, obviously, and I think um, you both alluded to it, it's really down the list of important things, but in the context of these competitions trying to uh, continue with a bit of integrity, there aren't many gap weeks for cancelled games or postponed games to be squeezed into, so... We will see how it all plays out. As of yet, EPCR have said there's no uh, word on those games being cancelled, the Munster Wasps one or the Scarlets one. So again, we'll have to see how it all plays out. Let's turn to the rugby that did happen. Leinster 10, Ulster 20. Darren, what was your uh, genuine expectation here ahead of this game at the RDS? Ulster had only ever won once in their history at the RDS in 2013. So what were you uh, looking at? Um, I thought, uh, I, uh, given Ulster had the poor result against Connacht, uh, then a month off was probably the worst time for that. Uh, I I didn't expect the, the game to be that close. Uh, I suppose at the end it wasn't, but I expected it to be the other way around. Um, I think the thing with, with Leinster is, and I don't think as a player, I don't think people sort of on the outside realise when you go to play Leinster, the team selection really doesn't matter. I, I said this on commentary at the time. Uh, there was times I went down to play Leinster and I wondered, were you better off actually getting Johnny Sexton, Guy Ringrose, Rob Carney et al, because you might get them on a bad night when they're not up for it. Uh, when you get the guys that are, that are, that are fighting for contracts, fighting for places, that's when you can actually get yourself in trouble. Uh, so I, my honest belief was that that was going to happen to Ulster the other night. I, I, it didn't matter uh, a dicky for me that Leinster were missing, you know, X players who had beaten the All Blacks. I fully expected um, Ulster to struggle, and I think, you know, from a Leinster point of view, they'll be very disappointed with how they played. But I think a lot of credit has to go for Ulster for the pressure uh, that they put Leinster under. So, what aspect of the game surprised you the most? 
Um, I thought uh, I just I felt like Ulster came in with a against Connacht. I felt like Ulster from a player point of view they played poorly, but from a coaching point of view, I really questioned the plan. What were they actually trying to achieve on both sides of the ball? Some of their defensive organisation, the Connacht attack was great, but and there were two intercepts, yes, but I just thought they were dreadful. Um, I thought it was the, the polar opposite uh, against Leinster. They had a real. Um, a really good game plan which involved when they had the ball and um, they were very um, pragmatic with the ball they didn't get the, if you if you saw it at the ground they were very very narrow Leinster are really known for filling the field and being very hard to get around with their line speed and Ulster didn't try to they played into the middle kept the passes really short and kept changing direction and held on to the ball as the game went on I actually thought Leinster or Ulster got a couple of decisions from the referee, but you need that if you're going to beat Leinster. But also Leinster gave away a lot of penalties. They lost their discipline. They were massively frustrated with Ulster. And it brought out the worst in Leinster. On the other side of the ball, I think the plan was to just flirt with the offside line all night and absolutely try and obliterate Leinster. And again, they did it. They forced them into mistakes. You look at the human try at the end when mm-hmm. Leinster were chasing the game. So it was a very simple but well-executed game plan. On the Leinster poor discipline point, Fiona, I mean, Leinster were not at their best. And yet when they got it back to 10 points apiece on 62, 63 minutes, I think most of us would have said, well, we've seen this movie before. We know how this ends. And yet, like, for example, at 10-10, Frank Murphy is screaming at Max Deegan to let go of a leg go. in the mall and he couldn't help himself when he lifts the leg in the mall and Nathan Doe comes on and makes a 13-10. And then a few moments later, I think 75th minute, Adam Byrne gets caught at the breakdown and to be fair, it was more good play from Rod Little, but it was yet another Leinster penalty. So they definitely contributed to their own downfall in lots of ways. You could tell Leo Cullen was not impressed with their breakdown work either, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you look at that back row that started with like with with Leinster. I mean, it was it was a really good back row. You had like Levy, Penny, Ruddock. I was expecting I was expecting a monster battle back there, you know. But I think Timmy McCann came out on top. They were out physical. I think there was a lot of uncharacteristic errors by uh, Leinster, but especially around that breakdown area. That Max Stegen thing was was probably the most frustrating thing as any coach that you could ever. You could clearly hear Frank Murphy talking about it. I know people. People, there was 15 penalties against uh, Leinster. I know people questioned it after the game, but fair, fair play to Leo Cullen. He came out and said, "We look at ourselves first. And and I, I really, really do think he need, they need to do that because he put the onus back in the players. As we know, there's no A games this year. Guys are going to get chances. It's going to be once once in a blue moon when you get out on a pitch if you're one of those fringe players and they're, and it's, guys didn't stand up and take their chance for that Leinster team and he really put it back on the players and it was really good to see. I, I imagine there will be a big backlash from them after this. Yeah, he really did. So some of his quotes afterwards, you could, I mean, this is Leo Cullen. This was all said in a very calm way, but mm. the words themselves. So he said, Fiona, uh, this was a kick in the backside for us. There's a lot of hype about this team. We need to make sure we don't listen to any of that. And then he was talking, you mentioned the physical stakes. We have to make sure the edge is always there. It's still man against man in the contact area. And then on the broader point, he was saying, look, when you mix up the team, it's great for competition for places, but obviously you risk losing cohesion. So he said of the players who come in, when a group doesn't deliver, then in many ways, sometimes that's their chance gone. That's the harsh reality. Some guys need to face that for sure. Now... That's a little glimpse, I think, Fiona, of how that performance will be received. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, as you said, he's very calm in how he speaks. And I suppose he was just disappointed. He was he gave these guys a chance he wanted to see. And as a coach, being out physical and out muscled at the breakdown, carrying into contact incorrectly. I mean, we spoke at the start of the season. I remember the first game Leinster played, saying their footwork in that contact area. And that would be coached them how they were how they were getting past the game line nearly in most carries. And we definitely, definitely didn't see that on Saturday. Saturday night and that's really disappointing to him and and he put the onus completely back in his players and he said guys some of you have had a chance now we're going to have to look because as Darren said I mean you can put out any any Leinster squad like you we've seen it they've put out different guys guys from the academy are mixed in the mix and it's it's normally the same things we see week in week out in that contact area and we just we just didn't see it on Saturday yeah I mean Darren the excuse and I suppose it is an excuse I'm about to make for Leinster you could equally make it for Ulster but in a sense you have a bunch of players here who haven't played in several weeks maybe training was a bit monotonous and it was a little bit hard to get going and there's a degree of maybe 
rust that sets in and Ulster had that wobble against Dragons and then responded brilliantly you would kind of anticipate this is just another wobble. Maybe they find it all too easy and they'll respond again. I don't know. It's hard to, when you're not inside the camp, it's hard to understand where that kind of a performance comes from. Um, from from a Leinster point of view, I actually often wonder how they select the team because there must be a little bit of just gut feeling. And I always wonder, does he like, does Leo just throw and uh, throw darts over his shoulder and see how they land on? Because, you know, Fiona's point about the back row, I, I had completely, because November went so well, I had actually completely forgotten about Will Connors. And it was only when I saw him on the bench and I thought, and then he actually, he got man on the match in one of the Six Nations games earlier in this year. And mm. um, so, uh, listen, uh, I liked Leo's interview. I definitely think a couple of decisions went uh, Ulster's way, but I don't like when coaches come out and blame that because as you guys say, okay, listen, there was a couple of 50-50 calls for sure. Of course there was. And as I said, you need luck to beat Leinster, particularly in the RDS. But there was also 12 penalties that were stupid and were born out of frustration that put in from, from Ulster, uh, how well Ulster played. So I liked that, that Leo did that. I think from the big picture, um, if I, like this is... That was a blip, and I think getting some manners put on you every now and again is a good thing. And it won't be nice for Leinster that it was Ulster and it was at home, but getting a bit up the backside is the best thing for you. Uh, look at what happened to Ulster uh, against Connacht. And I think one of the things that surprises me about Leinster the most of all the you know superlatives and all the, the things you can compliment them with, it is how often they, they come out and play like that. It just now, it always amazed me, like... There was time, you know, teams just don't play well four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks in a row. And they always manage to do it. Uh, and it's so rare they have a blip like this. So I don't think, and listen, uh, you know, I still fully expect them to finish uh, top of the table. And I fully, fully expect them to be uh, the favourites to win the final when they, when they probably get there. And I think they'll be there thereabouts in Europe. So getting a bit of the backside, albeit at home to Ulster, it's probably the best thing for them, to be honest. Yeah, it's maybe just more costly for the individuals who won't get as many chances now, given the nature of the season. And Leo Cullen's words about, well, this was your chance for a lot of them loom large, I would think. And Leinster absentees for this game, Ronan Kelleher, James Ryan, Ryan Baird, Keane Healy, Jack Conan, Josh van der Fleer, Caelan Doris, James Gibson Park, Johnny Sexton, Guy Ringrose, James Lowe, Hugo Keenan. I think they're going to be okay, Fiona. Never, yeah. never heard of it. Never heard of it. Any good? Who, any good? Who, yeah, who are they? Never heard of them. <laughs> I mean, that is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, yeah and you missed yeah. Andrew Porter as well. Who? You know? Did you miss Andrew, did you miss Andrew Porter? <laughs> I did. You know, I did. I missed, I missed Andrew Porter as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't read him either, Joe. He's yeah. the best who's had in the Northern Hemisphere. Look, they say he has a chance. I don't know. Um, by the way, just on Harry Byrne, I seem to be the Harry Byrne jinx. Anytime I'm there, he seems to get injured in the warm-up or not quite perform, have a great day. So I was just kind of curious, he came on on maybe 60, 65 minutes for Ross Byrne. Yeah, it was 65 minutes. The game was a 10 points piece. I, you, this isn't a, a major concerns over Harry Byrne, but just you, maybe there's a games you'd love to see him do a bit more at this stage because yeah, it was keeping a close line. I mean, kicked out in the full early on where he was outside the 22. Another moment where Leinster were on the attack and he was kind of around the edge and Adam Byrne was outside him and he tried to kick it through and kicked it out in the full as well. And 77th minute, this was Leinster's last real chance off a line out to kind of get things going. Look, maybe player alongside him overran the line at touch, but it wasn't the most sympathetic pass either and, and ball was dropped. Wait, what did you see from Harry Byrne, Darren? I'm, I'm curious your thoughts maybe generally on him. Um, so I haven't seen, there seems to be a huge hype about him from, like, listen, I've seen him play. I haven't seen him week in, week out, like most people have who, who follow Leinster religiously. Um I thought it, I actually completely agree with uh, with you, Joe, with regards to the weekend. I think it ended up being a, a costly call for Leinster. My perception of the Burden brothers is that Ross is so um, just so good at his job that it's almost boring, and that Harry has a wee bit of magic dust about him. And I felt at the time. Uh, even as an Ulster fan, I felt at the time that Leinster, their process was coming good. And at 10 all, I fully thought that um, the Leinster, if they kept what they were doing, were going to go on and win the game. And I do actually wonder if that changed in particular. And then, you know, we hate the phrase, but forcing it came to mind with, with Harry Byrne. And, um, you know, the example of that we chipped through. And I just wonder 
did that change? And is he more likely to try and pull a rabbit out of a hat? Um, can he do things from an X factor point of view that Ross can't? But ultimately, when it comes to sticking to a plan, if Ross had stayed on, you know, it felt like a 10 all. Leinster had the momentum and were on the way to winning 2010 themselves. So, listen, what I know, Joe, but that was the way I saw it. Well, I guess, you know, X factor is great and you want to encourage it, but I guess it needs to come off from time to time as well and especially when the game is the melting pot like that are we being a touch harsh here Fiona like I mean everybody who's anybody says this guy's the one you know and the one really to succeed Johnny along with Joey Carberry but on the evidence of that 20 minutes you'd say God there's a bit to go yet yeah, I just think, I think it's tiny margins and I think it's lack of game time for me when I'm watching him. I mean, like, he's he does have that X factor. We've seen it in parts, but it's been such a long layoff for these guys. He get He's gotten injured a couple of times. He's been on, taken off straight away. We've he, He's up with the Irish lads, you know what I mean? We didn't really see him. So I suppose we're all talking about the X factor, but we're not seeing enough, but I just think it's game. With Johnny ahead of him, his brother, as, he's, as, as Darren said, is the same safer is a safer bet I know he plays deeper than him I mean I love the way he plays on the game line that's what I love to see I love that X factor that um carrying that putting guys away so so we know Harry is safer so I think it's just getting more experience those tiny tiny margins the more game time he gets I think we'll start seeing paying that off but but playing on the Leinster squad with with you know Johnny Sex and his brother on it how much game time is he going to get that's the other question yeah so listen enough about Leinster Darren Let's talk Ulster. Let's talk. Come on. This is, you know, we're, we're, who cares? Have we, mentioned, have we mentioned Ulster yet? Barely. Barely. This, is, <laughs> this has been very much Leinster's loss as opposed to Ulster's <laughs> wins <laughs> so far. Uh, for Ulster now, six games into the URC, uh, they've won five. The Connacht slip up from their perspective, and Dan McFarland's comments afterwards told their own story, was unbelievably frustrating. They've been stewing on that for a number of weeks. This win to get back to five wins in six has a real back on track dynamic to it now this this kind of sets Ulster up what have you made of them over these uh, well not so much this game but over the previous five where did you think they were uh, I was um, I wouldn't sell, say critical of them uh, very much juries out I didn't think they played that well in the first four games I know they had uh, 20 points and you know bonus points everywhere I really wasn't that impressed and I thought some of the opposition was really poor um, and then when they played like that against Connacht I thought you know, Con- like we saw with Connacht look capable of on Friday when Connacht get going, they are a force to be reckoned with. But um, I was, a, I wouldn't say concerned. I was aware Ulster have a very tough fixture list coming up, as do a lot of teams. You know, away to Leinster, then I think they're away to the Ospreys in the Europe three interpros and back to Europe. So that's um, that's about ten games. That uh, so to start that block of games well is really really good for them. Um, and I suppose I have to hold my hands up. I definitely didn't think they were capable um, of beating Leinster. And, you know, it puts them in a strong place now. It gives them a bit of momentum. And, and suddenly things change very quickly in rugby. And suddenly they're probably not that scared of going to the Ospreys. And then there'll be, uh, you might even see a bit of a rotation for next week going into Europe mm. and three derbies over Christmas. And hopefully these games all happen. But um, I think they're in. Um, if you've got someone like myself that would be working pretty much every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I don't get too many opportunities to bring my son to a game, um, would I look upon an incident such as that and decide that I want to bring him to Dalyman Park or uh, to, for example, a Bohemian Shamrock Rovers derby on a Friday night at Dalyman Park? Absolutely not. I wouldn't even consider bringing my seven-year-old to Dalyman um, for a derby game such as that. In the knowledge that there have been incidents such as the one we saw yesterday in the past pretty routinely when it comes to certain fixtures and it happened again yesterday so that'd be one point i'd make but again it is a tiny minority it's a handful of thugs that have gotten themselves involved in a, something that i would imagine and therefore their part was preordained and it's very hard. I'm not saying anybody is doing it, but very rude to tarnish the League of Ireland over a Hamish football club as a whole with the brush that will be used to tar those guys yesterday. Yeah. Um, now, all Bohemians can do is make the sort of statement they've made today, go to every length possible to, in conjunction with the Gardaí to identify those involved and ensure the right steps are taken to prevent those guys from ever entering Dalyman Park again or any League of Ireland ground ever again. But you made the point, perhaps they don't go to games. I mean, they were just 
a group that had trouble in mind and didn't have tickets for the game and just went out for what they saw would be a bit of fun. Um, we don't have any knowledge of the facts, really, apart from that at the moment. No. I don't care about the name. I've never cared about the name. If you're a, a player and a pro player and a pro player at all level, you shouldn't care about the names you're playing with or against. It's who's doing well. And the real, the managers, the top managers, don't care about that. Um, I had a laugh at the weekend of show was doing fine top. I was saying the, the, the player I never quite got the way everyone else did was, was Beckham because, you know, for a variety of reasons. But he was undroppable for England. No one should be undroppable. Absolutely. It doesn't matter if you're Bugba, Beckham, Varane, you name it, Ronaldo. It doesn't matter. If you're not doing the job, you don't get picked. And you want, look at somebody like Klopp, and he will. He'll leave them out. You look at absolute pep. He doesn't give a stuff who you are. You could be the best player in the world, but if you're, you know, you could be the guy that thinks the team's ticking. But if you're not doing it for a week or two weeks maximum, you're out. And to be honest, the main man at that is Tuchel at the moment. Mm. He doesn't care. And could I interject for a second? I totally accept that. And I, I, I totally subscribe to what you're saying in theory. Isn't the fear in reality, if you're a coach, especially if you're not going to win straight away, that the dressing room can turn a bit toxic, that these big names are looming presences and fans can say, well, what's it? he's not even playing Ronaldo. You know, Roy Keane even kind of headed in that direction post-match. So I, I get it when you're in a position of pep power. How can you question pep? How can you question Tuchel? They can drop what they want. New man Rangnick in, you're gone in six months, mate. Pff, good luck dropping me. I'll tell you what, Rangnick, so what? I'm not going to be there in six months. I'm going to be doing a different job. I might as well do it my way. OTB AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move.